Well, Mike, we've got some great questions here, so um, I'm ready if you are. Might as well just jump in. Sure. All right. Our first uh, two questions are going to be from Jared, and his first question is, do you think that the original audience for Genesis 3.15 would have actually understood that a single Savior would come to defeat the snake? I just can't see the sentence uses a singular, and it looks to me like we will always be fighting with the snake, not a prophecy of a Savior. People like to quote that passage a lot, but it seems like a pretty bad prophecy, if anything. Yeah, I, I, I think there are things in the passage that would point to uh, a singular, you know, I hate to use the word fulfillment because, you know, the word fulfill is like the word cute, you know, like it doesn't really mean anything because, you know, we tend to think cause and effect, you know, one-to-one correspondence, whereas New Testament writers, you know, they, they see fulfillment in a whole spectrum of ways, analogies, typologies, symbols, and so on and so forth. But for the sake of this question, I'll use it. You know, I, I do think that there are things in the passage that would point to a single person, quote, fulfilling this, uh, this you know, verse. That is not to say, though, that all the other stuff in the question isn't true as well. So, I mean, if you just look at it, you know, it's Genesis 3.15, we might as well you know, quote that passage. Let me just open up a Bible here and read it. I don't want to assume that everyone sort of has this in their head. So Genesis 3.15, and it'll sound familiar, even if you didn't know exactly where it came from. This is part of the uh, the judgment of the Nakash, the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise bruise his heel. That's the ESV, and we're going to talk about the translation a little bit as well. The you in this passage, you know, they're singular. They refer to the serpent. Okay, so I will put enmity between you, singular, you know, but your offspring. Again, these are, these are singular, second person singular pronouns that refer to the serpent. So sure, you know, the in that sense, since the serpent, you know, is actually, you know, what we have here is a supernatural being and he lives on and so on. Like he's not terminated or anything. So it's obvious in that sense that the struggle, the enmity, okay, is ongoing. That that That's obvious from the text. And since that's the case, the serpent's metaphorical offspring points to, you know, this ongoing time, uh, you know. And, and also, if that's, the, if that's true, then her seed— Okay, the woman's seed is also ongoing to have this ongoing conflict. You can't, it, it, it can't just work one way. It has to work both. So th- this notion that, you know, we're always going to be fighting, you know, w- the effect of the fall, that, that's obvious. I mean, it's, it's transparent from the, ta- the text, but it's also a little bit narrow because it excludes certain things. The text also indicates that the ongoing number isn't specifically the point. The idea is that First, there will be the struggle, and that, that's on the table for sure. And then also, at some point, a particular human will crush the serpent's head because we, we can't exclude the line, he shall bruise. This is a third-person singular pronoun in the, in the Hebrew text. And that has to point to a particular human offspring of the woman. So he, you know, some, some seed of the woman is going to again, do some damage or inflict, you know, some harm or whatever on the serpent. So it it does funnel down to a particular person. The same individual is also marked as suffering some affliction from the serpent. Again, just the second part of the verse, he shall bruise your head. He, her offspring, some particular offspring is going to bruise your head, you know, Nakash, and you shall bruise his heel. Okay. So, there's a particularity here that should not be excluded from the verse. And, and that's why I would say, you know, there are indications in the text that this can point to a very specific fulfillment. Now, most scholars uh, see Paul, for instance, referencing this verse in Romans 16.20. Let me just read that verse. And this is probably less known uh, compar- in, by comparison. Paul writes to the Romans in the last chapter, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Okay. So again, most scholars think this is a reference on Paul's part to Genesis 3.15 because of the vocabulary here. 
feet, again, a reference to Satan, the crushing, so on and so forth. You know, I would, I would, you know, I don't have anything to disagree with there. However, we need to actually take a, a look at, at, at the verse. In Romans 16, 20, where it says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. It, it's your feet, and it's plural. So it, it's actually a reference to the, to the church, to the believers. Okay, it's not a reference to, to Jesus, again, in that verse doing the crushing. But so, so you have this sort of transference. I would say it this way. It, there's an indirect reference to Jesus here in what Paul's writing you know, as the Savior, because believers are corporately the body of Christ, okay? And believers would not be in that status without Christ. The fact that Revelation 12 also connects the birth of the Messiah with the demise of Satan, the serpent, I mean, that language is in Revelation 12, also indicates that there's some illusion going on in connection with Jesus, back to Genesis 3.15. So in, in the one passage, Romans 16, 20, you have the, the bruising or the crushing idea. of Revelation 12, you don't have that. But nevertheless, the connection is made as, as to how this sort of works. Now, just as a sidebar, ESV, you, you probably noticed, has both lines in the second half of Genesis 3.15 translated the same way. It says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You know, bruise twice there. It has the same translation. Now, that translation, just for those who might, this might pop into your head, or if you're really into this verse, you're going to wonder, you're going to ask the question, why didn't Mike say something about this? Well, I'm going to, okay? The translation presumes that the lemma, you actually, you know, had software or used a concordance here, shoof, is truly the same. So if, if you're going to translate it, both of them as bruised, the translator's probably assuming that we got the same lemma in both places. But you could have a homograph. Remember, this audience should know what homographs are, a word that is spelled exactly the same way as another word, but they have two different meanings. They're two different semantics. It could also be something what, again, this is an academic term, a you know, linguistics term. It could be a biform. And I'll try to explain briefly what that is, but this is actually a debate. You know, like, do we have the same lemma in the, in the verse twice, or do we have two different lemmas that actually look the same? That's a debate that, that scholars have about Genesis. You'll, you'll run into it in commentaries. So it may be, I mean, it's indeterminate. It may be that the same lemma is intended in both places. And again, ESV reflects that. But it's also possible that we have the two separate lemmas that are homographs. It's, it's equally possible. If they are homographs, you've got two different lemmas here. One means to bruise. The other one would, would be something like to snap at or snatch at. You know, think of a, of a serpent, you know, trying to bite somebody's heel, okay? So there... That that very well could be what we have here. And so you're, you're going to see certain translations try to distinguish between these two things. And, and this is part of the thinking, uh, part of what may be going on in the translator's head. Uh, as far as the biform option, again, this is a, this is a linguistic you know, term where you have, you have two not identical lemmas, but they, they're, they're very close, and, the, and specifically, there are only certain consonants in Hebrew that works this way. So you can have one that is spelled with the, you know, the S-H, the Aleph, or the S-H and the, and the, the W, the Vav, and the P, and another one that's S-H, and then the Aleph and the P. Depending on what grammatical form the one with the middle Aleph is put into, it, it can work out spelling-wise, vocalization-wise, as shuf, just like the other one. Even though they're not homographs, they're still two different lemmas, but they can look the same in the text. And so, hence this question. Uh, another sidebar, the Septuagint translates these lemmas with the same Greek word, same Greek lemma. So the Septuagint translator probably is looking at this and thinking they come from the same source. You know, Casuto in his commentary writes about this. Um, if you have Casuto's Genesis commentary, be the first volume. Uh, he talks about what the options are. So you could go look that up. Uh, but again, I, I just wanted people to know that this is why certain translations in English, some of them will be identical, same word two times, just like ESV, other ones will vary the vocabulary. So this is part of, of the issue. But as to the original question, yeah, this can certainly funnel into a very particular offspring of the woman. Uh, so that is exegetically defensible. His second question is, a scholar in our church recently said that writing wasn't developed enough for Moses to actually write down the Pentateuch. He said, it's not like Moses was carrying around tablets that he wrote all this down on. 
that threw me a bit and I didn't know what to make of it because I thought the Egyptians were using papyrus long before that. Can you comment on this and how it was likely originally recorded? Yeah, I mean, I've I've made the comment before as well that Moses isn't carrying a tray of cuneiform tablets along with him, you know, during the Exodus because, you know, you a lot of the content in Genesis does hook into Babylonian texts, and and I've said before in the podcast my suspicion is that either Genesis one through eleven was either you know written during the exile or was heavily edited again using the Akkadian Babylonian material to to articulate a polemic, a theological polemic in those 11 chapters. And that, if that's the case, well then, you know, since that's part of the Torah, then, you know, you have the, the same question arise uh, for different reasons, you know, about the rest of the Torah. My view is, again, just generally, and then I'll get to the, to the specifics of the question, is that I, I don't accept JEDP, the, 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 you know, the consensus view among scholars that the, the Pentateuch, the Torah, was not written at all by Moses. It's a it's a patchwork quilt of sources and so on and so forth. I don't accept that view, but I also don't accept the, the traditional view that Moses, you know, wrote wrote the Torah. You know, ninety nine percent of it or a hundred percent of it. Uh, I think it's somewhere in the middle. I'm what used to be called a supplementarian, and there are different reasons for that. Now, uh, that is preparatory to say you, you you should have detected in that answer that I don't have a problem with Moses being able to write stuff in the Torah. There were another reason that this, you know, scholar in this church said this. He's really basing this on the fact that there are no Paleo-Hebrew inscriptions that we know of that are earlier than 1000 BC. I have to know a little bit about Hebrew. The, the, the Hebrew that you're used to seeing today is not the original Hebrew script. Uh, there's a Paleo-Hebrew script that would have been used, you know, by Moses or anybody else. In, in greater antiquity, the, the script that you're familiar with now comes uh, out of the Babylonian exile. Uh, it, it's an adoption of, of you know, Aramaic, in that case, the, the script that they were using there, and that is, is referred to as the block letter style. That is not, again, what Hebrew letters look like in the biblical period, okay, something before 1000 BC or even, even a little bit later than that. So if you look at that material that's been recovered from the ancient world, there are no Hebrew inscriptions that I'm, I'm just using round numbers here that are earlier than 1000 BC. Well, if Moses lived, you know, 1400 BC, he is when he died, you know, 1525 to, you know, 1405 BC, you know, obviously he's living in the period for which we do not have epigraphic or inscriptional evidence for old Hebrew. So that's really what, what's behind this statement. Now, having said that, it's an assumption. But if that's all we have here on, on, on this person's part. It is, of course, an assumption that this means, the fact that we don't have inscriptions older than 1000 BC in Old Hebrew, that's an assumption that that fact, that absence in the archaeological record, means that the written form of Hebrew wasn't developed. You can't really draw that conclusion. You could have written Hebrew developed, and maybe we just don't have stuff that you know, was produced in it. I mean, if you think about the Hebrews, you know, why, why do we have inscriptions from any culture? It's because they had a settled civilization. There was the occasion, the need to produce documentary evidence like, you know, stela or inscriptions or whatever, economic records. None of this applies to the Hebrews in Moses' day. The reason that, that would, you know, I wouldn't expect there to be you know, like original tablet forms or you know, on any medium, you know, of the Torah in Old Hebrew, is because the Hebrews weren't a settled people. There, there's no reason for them to produce material that we can point at and look at. It's oh yeah, you know, the Hebrews living back back around Moses' time. They they were literate. Look at look at that look at that inscription there. Why would they produce it? They're not settled in a land. I mean, what's the point? They're not they're not producing receipts or economic records like you see with cuneiform tablets. They don't have any of that. They're wandering around in a desert. You know, they're, they're, they're on their way to a land. And once they get in, you know, they got to you know, basically start the whole thing from scratch, you know, their, their civilization. So it, there's, there's not a necessary connection between the absence of inscriptional data and the idea that the language itself wasn't developed in writing. So that's the first problem. Again, the historical circumstances. Now, Moses, 
would have been highly literate if we accept the biblical account of the guy Moses. He would have been highly literate as someone trained in Pharaoh's household. He'd be expected to read and write Egyptian and very likely Akkadian, at least be able to read Akkadian. And that's especially true if the Exodus was a late Exodus. Just think the, the, the 1200s BC instead of the early date. If you don't know what I'm talking about here, go, go listen to the first four or five episodes of the Book of Exodus series. If it's a later date, this is especially true that Moses would be literate in Egyptian and Akkadian writing because Akkadian was the language of international correspondence during this period. The Tel El Amarna letters okay, are written in Akkadian. It's a correspondence between Pharaoh and his underling authorities in what we would call now the Holy Land in, in, in Palestine. It's, a, it's all Akkadian. It's not Egyptian, it's Akkadian. So if the Hebrew language, again, had been put to writing, there is no reason to suppose that Moses wouldn't have known that language, that script as well. I mean, he, he, you know, he knows Egyptian, he knows Akkadian. If Hebrew, again, the language of his native you know, people, if that has been put into writing, there's no reason to suspect that he wouldn't know it. Now, it is a reasonable expectation that that language had a written form since, because, the Proto-Sinaitic inscriptions date to 400 years earlier than the late date of the Exodus. Again, if you, if you don't know what those are, the Proto-Sinaitic inscriptions are important because they are the beginning of the Semitic alphabet, okay? Where someone had some of the turquoise mines in Sinai, okay? And this predates the, the, the early date of the Exodus. So this has nothing to do with the Exodus, okay? But you've got somebody who's taking Egyptian characters and using them to create an alphabet. And the inscriptions that are in that Egyptian-looking alphabet are Semitic. Okay, they conform to the, to the, to the grammar of, of, of Semitic languages. Okay, we don't know who those people were. There's no way to identify them, again, despite you know, claims to the contrary. I mean, there, there are people out there that say, oh, we, we know that the biblical Hebrews produced the proto-Sinaitic inscriptions. Well, actually, you don't because all of the features that can be known from those inscriptions are also parts of other Semitic languages. There's no way to directly tie it to the, the Hebrews in you know, the Bible. Okay, there, there's no way to do that, even though you know, people, it's a nice idea, wouldn't that be cool? But you, you got nothing there, okay? So all that to say, I think there, that this conclusion that this scholar, again, in, in your church drew it's based upon a, a point of fact, this data about we don't have a Hebrew inscriptions past, you know, or earlier than 1000 BC. But it requires making certain assumptions about what that means that I don't think really hold together well. Or let, let me just be more charitable, that, that lack certainty. So again, if, if Moses is who the Bible says he was, he's going to be highly literate. If the language of his people exists in an alphabet, you better believe that there's no reason to conclude he wouldn't know that. Okay. Again, so, you know, we don't know one way or the other, but it's a reasonable thing to conclude that, yeah, Moses could have written stuff. Our next question is from Evan. I have a question about 1 Kings 22, 22, 1 Samuel 16, 14, and Ezekiel 14, 9. Each verse speaks about an evil or lying spirit coming from God. One extremely popular pastor uses these verses to say that God has predestined and is governing all man's sin. Is God causing, tempting, or predestining the sin of false prophecy? Finally, is the divine council member in these verses evil or tempting? The, the short answer to these questions are, or is, no and no. Okay? You know, I just... Get a, I get questions like this about what some people are listening to and what other people are saying that ought to know better. And just part of me just dies. And so <laughs> um, this is, this is a seriously flawed notion. So you know, one of those passages, first Kings 22, 22, that, that's going to ring bells, you know, with this audience, because that's the Micaiah passage, first Kings 22, 19 through 23, where we have, you know, a, a divine council session. So again, I'm going to read that just in case people aren't aware of this. 
prophet Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. Okay, so that's your first clue to, to one of the problems with, with this assumption that this quote-unquote popular pastor is teaching. You have the host of heaven, the heavenly host, i.e. angelic beings, if you want to use that terminology, standing beside the Lord as the Lord sits on his throne. So they're, they're intelligent entities, okay? The Lord said, who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at remote Gilead? And one said one thing, another said another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord. There's a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, by what means? He said, I will go out, be a lying spirit, the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. So that's verse 22, a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And that's the, one of the, the launching points for the question. So I, I would just putting that passage in, in everyone's head. And then the first Samuel 16, 14 verse, we might as well read this and I'll get to the one of Ezekiel in a bit. First Samuel 16, 14. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. Again, this is ESV. So having those two floating around in our heads now, my first question is, why would we assume that there's sin going on? Why? If the lying spirit is from God, by definition, it isn't sin. God doesn't sin. He doesn't like sin. Why would we conclude that God is endorsing or creating or predestinating sin? Okay, it, it's just, it, it creates a, a number of conundra, you know, it, by virtue of the logic problem there. And the, and the example from 1 Kings is particularly wrongheaded, again, for, for other reasons. I'm going to try to try to funnel my discussion here. The spirit comes from the group. The group is the heavenly host standing in Yahweh's presence. Why would we expect that evil, rebellious spirits, spirits who are in rebellion, they don't report for work, okay? They're not on God's payroll anymore. Why would we assume that? Again, it, it doesn't make sense on, on a number of levels. So we, again, I think the real issue here is, is this whole notion of lying and deception and so on and so forth. So you go to 1 Samuel 16, 14, and I would say drawing the conclusion that we have moral evil here really reflects either a lack of knowledge about the semantic range of this word that gets translated evil. It's the word ra, okay? We either have a lack of knowledge of the semantic range or we have, let's be blunt, just laziness. You, you never looked it up, okay? This word does not need to indicate moral evil. Okay, Ra can mean other things besides moral evil, i.e. sin. Let me go, just go through a few examples. Genesis 37.2, okay? So, I mean, I can just sit here and do a quick search. I mean, this doesn't take a whole lot of effort here. This is Genesis 37.2. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Okay, he brought a bra, okay, bad report. Did Joseph sin when he reported to his father? Is, is there moral evil in, in the report? I mean, is there something about the report that is evil? The uttering of the report. Now you could say, well, the content's evil because the sons are just, you know, they're not doing their job or whatever. Yeah, we know that. Th that's the content of the report. But uh, what, I'm, what I'm asking is, is the report itself, is it morally evil? Does it have something to do with sin? No. Okay, you keep going in Genesis 37, verse 20, that the word shows up again. Come now. This is the brothers plotting against Joseph. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal, a ra animal, has devoured him. What, is the animal sinful? Is the animal guilty of moral evil? doing what animals do. How about verse 33? Again, we keep going in the same chapter. This is when they hand the cloak with, with blood on it to Jacob. He identified it and said, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. A ra animal. Again, is, is the animal sinning? You know, I'm hoping you, you see the point here. This is a little ridiculous, but let's keep going. Genesis 41. Okay, Genesis 41. 33. This is, the, this is Joseph with, you know, interpreting Pharaoh's dream, okay? Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. That's verse 33. 
And here's verse 34. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And let him let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for the food in the cities. That food shall be a reserve for the land against, against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land so that, you know, the people aren't going to perish. Now, can anybody guess where, you know, Ra occurs? I mean, we didn't, we didn't come across anything that sounded, you know, like, like moral evil. Okay. But we actually have a reference to what? We have famine and years of plenty. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from the vision of the cows, if you remember. So if we go back up into the verse, okay, this is Genesis 41, 3 and 4 now. So I went to 33 and 34. That's the context. Go back to verses 3 and 4. Here's where you get the word, actually. Behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive plump cows. The word ugly is ra. So should we say, behold, seven other cows who were sinful and thin came up out of the Nile after them. And those sinful, thin cows ate up the other ones. Again, you, you could go on and on. Uh, with, with these kind of examples. I'll do one more. Leviticus 26, 6. 26, 6. I will give you peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will remove the harmful beasts from the land. I will remove the ra beasts from the land. I'll remove the sinful beasts. From the, no, again, ra as a term need not have anything to do with sin and moral evil. What it really means, again, broadly, the semantic range of this, yes, it can include moral evil, obviously, but it can also indicate something unfavorable, harmful, dangerous, and of course, in in Joseph's interpretation of Pharaoh's dream, ugly. Boy, these cows just don't look good. Okay, they're stricken by famine. They, they They look awful. So Ra can, can mean those neutral things. Now, if we go back to 1 Samuel 16, 14, where the spirit of the Lord departs from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. That's actually a good, a good translation. There's something about this spirit, and it could go either way. It could be an entity, because, you know, 1 Kings 22, we have entities there. Or it could just be God afflicting Saul internally, you know, psychologically, Saul's own spirit, okay, something like that. It could, could go either way, you know, commentators, you, could, you can look this up in virtually any commentator, the commentary that's serious, that engages the text, and, you know, you'll get this discussion. But, but the whole idea is that either God is sending a spirit to trouble Saul, to make him uncomfortable, maybe, you know, harm him psychologically, uh, make him a wreck, make him anxious, irritable, or, again, it, you know, it, it could be that, that it's a reference to Saul's internal disposition at all. It doesn't have to have anything to do with moral evil. It's just something unfavorable, harmful, just some, something you wouldn't want to have happen to you, that kind of thing. I, I think, you know, again, that, that's what's going on in 1 Samuel 16. You get another example in Judges 9. God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the rulers of Shechem. In, in other words, there, 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 there's something that God does that creates a conflict between the, these, these two groups. Again, one party, you know, one side of the equation is getting judged and the other you know, side is not, so on and so forth. So God is judging who he wants to judge, you know, who, who deserves judgment. And I think that's what's going on in, in these sorts of verses. You, know, you go to Ezekiel 14.9. Again, let's just read that since that was brought up. If the prophet is deceived and speaks a word, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and will destroy him in the midst of my people Israel. Now, the word, you know, Ra doesn't appear in that passage, but it's the idea of God sending, God deceiving, you know, a, a, some prophet, okay, to, to destroy him, all right? So all of these things, Ezekiel 14, 1 Samuel 16, what they come down to is that God is judging evil. So here's the question. Is God allowed to use deception or trickery or just make somebody irritable so it starts a fight? Is he allowed to use those means to judge evildoers? 
I'll, I'll follow that with another question. Who's going to tell him that he can't? Of course he can. Okay, God gets to judge evil in whatever way God deems fit. And we did a whole episode on God's use of deception to judge evil. That's episode 210 for anyone who wants to go back and listen to it. God doing that, you know, such things are not evil, for evil is defined, again, in a very basic way for the sake of this Q&A, as that which is contrary to God's will. God doesn't ordain the violations of his own will. He doesn't violate his own will. What he does is, by definition, not a violation of his own will. God can judge evil however he wills without violating his own will. That's what it comes down to. Judging evil as well is consistent with God's moral character. So I think what, what's tripping up the discussion here is this talk about, you know, deception and God doing something. You know, I, I got news for you. At the end of the road, at the end of the day, God is going to deny eternal life to the, to the wicked. So God's means of judging the wicked, short of their eternal destiny, God can do what he wants to judge evil. And he does. Again, you go back and listen to episode 210, you'll get other examples of, of, of God using these sorts of means. Chris in Ledyard, Connecticut, has our next question. In studying the Lord's Prayer, I've discovered that the Greek word typically translated in English Bibles as daily, as in give us this day our daily bread, is a mystery. It seems that no one really knows what the true meaning of the word is, and over time different suggestions have been made, including daily bread, the bread for tomorrow, the super substantial or supernatural bread, Example, Jesus himself. Can Dr. Heiser provide any additional insight into what the best translation of this word might be? Based on the literary mm. structure of the Lord's Prayer and its location within the Sermon on the Mount, does Dr. Heiser lean toward a natural or supernatural interpretation of the bread in the Lord's Prayer? And the second part, I'll just say, I, you know, I, I think it's natural. I think it's talking about physical needs in, in that passage anyway. The other one, I, I'm in favor of using other parts in the near context, really the same verse and verses, as the difficult word occurs. I mean, there, there's other vocabulary in there that, that I think helps us narrow the possibilities as far as interpretation goes. So let's unpack this a little bit because I think people may not be aware of the difficulty here. So on the one hand, in part, there's not much of a mystery. You, know, you, you look at Matthew 6.10. Okay, let's just get started in Matthew. This prayer, of course, occurs in more than one gospel. But Matthew 16, your kingdom come, your will be done, or Matthew 6.10, I should say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's verse 11, give us this day our, and then ESV has daily bread. So we have here, give us, and then we have the term, same eron. It means tomorrow. Okay, so that, that, it's a time-orienting word. And then it's followed by another term, which is the, the, the troublesome one. The lemma there is epousios. That's the one that there's amb ambiguity. Like, what does that term mean? And we'll get into it, that. It, 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 it's pretty rare, okay? But my suggestion is going to be, let's use the word tomorrow to help us narrow the understanding of the word that is less clear. And let's, you know, loop in sort of a, a, a bit of logic here. Jesus would prob probably endorse the idea of praying every day. And so if you're in the habit of using this prayer as a pattern of prayer regularly, and you know that the time word in there is oriented by, you know, tomorrow, that, that does give you this day-by-day, quote-unquote, daily feel to it. And again, that, that's, that's how most commentators, you know, the, the trajectory they follow. So let's just go back to the term. You know, same Iran, the, the, this first term, again, means tomorrow. It's the same word that occurs later in Matthew 6, in verse 34, where it clearly means tomorrow. Again, you can look up the, the term. The Lord's Prayer in Luke, though, Luke 11.3 uses different terminology. It, it, it's ta kath, which is from kata hameron. It literally means that which or what is according to a day. So you, you have, again, this, this not, not the tomorrow sense. Uh, if you're praying the prayer, again, 
with regularity. The, the, the tomorrow language makes sense. But here you have, again, what is according to a day or to the day. So again, you have this daily sense. And that phrase, again, is in turn clarified by other things in, in, in the passage. So if we take what, what we know, again, you've got this tomorrow and you've got hameron, which is the normal word for day. You've got this according to the day or according, you know, that which is according to a day. If, if you have the, the, these words that, that are easy to, to grasp and comprehend, my predilection is going to be to use them to help us understand the word that is more difficult, the second one, epiousion, okay? So if we go to BDAG, which is the uh, Bauer, Donker, Arndt, and Gingrich lexicon, standard lexicon for the Greek New Testament, the entry on epiousios, it, it says this in part, according to Origen, that's the, the patristic father, this was coined by the evangelists. Okay, like, like this is a term they made up, he says. Now, the, the, the entry is going to go a little bit away from that or, you know, kind of, sort of, it's, it's going to be rare. It's going to be unusual. So part of the entry will say that uh, maybe origin was kind of onto something here. You know, it, it's, it's kind of unique, but then if you go, you know, elsewhere through the entry, you're going to see, you know, some other examples or, or similar terms. And so maybe they did coin the term. Maybe they, they sort of altered a, a, a known term again, that, that, has more of a chronological orientation to come up with this one. Again, this is the discussion that lexicographers are going to have. So you, you, you go through the entry and it, they list a, a bunch of interpretations. And I'm going to give you three of them. There are other trajectories in the entry, but, but here's three. The question is, what is epiousios derived from? And if, if they coined this term or if it, maybe they just, they, they took other terms that were common, put them together and sort of, you know, made their own or, or there's some nuancing here. That can be otherwise understood. So the, the, here's, here's one. I'm going to give you three. One option is that it derives from epi and usia, which BDAG translates as that which is necessary for existence. And they cite Origen and Chrysostom and Jerome as, you know, th this is the trajectory they take. This is where they think it comes from. So epi and usia. Combining those two Greek terms to form epi usias. And the meaning would be that which is necessary for existence. And since we need to exist every day, which would be nice, we can't take a day off from existence, daily captures the idea. And of course, it's consistent with the, the other chronological language in the passage. However, there are a couple of other options. Some would say it is a substantivizing, it's a grammar term, of epitain usan, which would mean for the current day, it, it, and, and there's a little note in BDAG, when you get this phrase, epitain usan, according to what is necessary, you, you, you sort of, you can imply that, that again, a, a, daily sort of necessitary, uh, a daily sort of necessity is implied here. And so they, they say you could, you could, if that's where it comes from, it would mean something like for the current day or for today. And for each of these, they, they're going to cite, you know, different passages in Greek literature that get you to those terms, you know, epitain usan or epi usia. You know, th th those, those are terms you're going to find in other Greek literature and the context is consistent. They're, they're saying, well, maybe the, maybe the gospel writers, you know, used these passages or this kind of language to coin their own term. Third, they also say and cite examples that it, it could mean for the following day, again, using one of these breakdowns and then going that trajectory for the following day. And that, is, that goes well with the, the presence of Samaron. In, uh, in Matthew, which means tomorrow. So again, you, we could go down other, other trajectories, but the term is very, un, it, it's rare, it's unusual. Its derivation is not a, it's not a mystery in that there are no possibilities as, as to you know, having any hope of explaining this. That's not true. It's uncertain as to which one of the possibilities actually happened or actually is in the picture. That's the part that's uncertain. But as far as where this term might have come from, again, there are good options here. And a translation like daily or, you know, for, for, for tomorrow or for the current day, something like that, that, that's well within the semantic range of these options and makes sense uh, given the, sort of the boots on the ground existence of the people that are listening to Jesus. Our last question is from Curtis in College Station, Texas. Does the story of the prodigal son in Luke fifteen eleven through 32 
elude to Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9. The father giving the inheritance to the rebellious son seems to match up fairly well. Yeah, this, this one is actually going to be short. It might surprise the audience because the, the question includes Deuteronomy 32. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, in, in Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, Yahweh doesn't give away his inheritance. He takes Israel as his inheritance. Now, I'm, I'm sure the thought process here, what's behind the question is, is the idea of abandoning humanity more generally, you know, the surrender of the nations and so on and so forth. But the inheritance language that's actually in the verse pertains specifically to Israel, not to the nations that are being abandoned. So if, if, if we're thinking about inheritance being a potential link between Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9 and the prodigal son, you know, parable, if, you, if you're zeroing in on the inheritance, it doesn't fit because Yahweh is take. I'll use the, the language of Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20, the parallel of Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9. Yahweh takes his inheritance. He takes Israel as his own. He doesn't give it up. He takes it. So it, it's actually the, the reverse of the prodigal uh, situation. But again, I, I think where the question really you know, comes from is the notion of the, the you know, disinheritance is a term I like to use, or the, the abandonment of the nations. But again, the language of you know, Deuteronomy 32 specifically relates to taking Israel as the inheritance. Now, sure, if God elects Israel, we we'll use the, the E word there, if God elects Israel, then the others are non-elect. Okay, I mean, I, I can see that. But in the, if, you, if you take that idea from Deuteronomy or the Old Testament generally, God making a positive choice suggests, you know, obviously, on the other hand, the negative choice. When you go to the prodigal son in Luke 15, again, it, it, it still doesn't line up, you know, very well. Uh, because in that case, you'd have you'd have someone not being disinherited. He doesn't disinherit the prodigal. He, he gives him what he wants, but he's still his son. And the son comes back, and you know he everything is you know turns out you know well, and so on and so forth. And he comes to his senses and, and all that. So he, he, even under some of those assumptions, it doesn't in my head it doesn't really align well. All right, uh, Mike. Well, I can, I can I can hear the enthusiasm in your voice you know, as yeah. as we speak. All right, Mike. Try to contain yourself, Trey. (laughs) Very hard. Very hard to do, Mike. You're such a sweet. No. I don't know where I'm going with that. All right, Mike. Hey, (laughs) (laughs) let's let's get through our questions here. We got some good questions. Well, it it ended well. (laughs) Yeah. We got some good questions from some good people here. So let's let's just get at it. Uh, Our first one's from Jason from Tempe, Arizona. And his question is What does the Bible mean? when it refers to gods that came recently, Deuteronomy 32, 17, and Psalm 80, 10 in the Septuagint, does this recency refer to the glorification of beings that were previously in some way like humans, i.e. believers in the Most High God, who later were glorified and given responsibilities to protect and govern a subsequent generation of mortal beings? To me, this seems somehow like a repeating cycle, since Paul refers to believers being transformed at the second coming, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one, And John refers to believers as being called sons of God, 1 John 3, 1. Recency of Godhood is mentioned in the Septuagint Psalm 80, which in modern Bibles is Psalm 81. And Psalm 80, 10 reads, verse 9, mm-hmm. There shall be no recent God among you, nor shall you do obeisance to a foreign God. What is it about the gods that make them not only created, but also recent? Yeah, the the answer to this is a lot simpler than the the question might suggest. And Jason actually has the answer in the question. And that is Psalm 80, verse 10. So, you know, the the talk about transformation, believers, you know, humans being transformed, is all eschatological. There, there's, no, there's nothing in Scripture that refers to this happening in the past. So the repeating cycle is, is just something that is sort of an idea imported into the text. There's really no basis for that. But the answer, again, is a lot simpler. The idea of, of recent gods refers to the gods. And just think of Deuteronomy 32, okay? Deuteronomy 32, 17. They, they didn't you know, worship God. They worshiped, you know, these other gods. They worshiped Shadim, you know, gods that they had not known. You know, and then again, you get this recency language in it. 
This refers to gods that Israel encountered since the Exodus period, as opposed to the God whom their fathers and ancestors had worshipped centuries prior to that. In other words, Yahweh. So to worship a different God than your ancestors did, that's a recent God. It's a more you know recent God. And, and by definition, it would be a foreign God. It would be a different God. And if you look at Psalm 80, verse 10, you know, which, uh, again, you, you had read, and I'm, I'm going to read from the Lexham English Septuagint here. There will not be a new God in you, nor will you bow down to a foreign God. Well, there you have the new God language, and in parallel, it's parallel, the idea is to foreign. So new God, foreign God, right there's the answer uh, in the verse. So these recent gods, these recent deities that Israel was, was worshiping and shouldn't have been worshiping are gods that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their forefathers, of course, at the Exodus did not. You know, and, and so Deuteronomy 32 Again, even if Moses wrote that, the answer is still, you know, pertinent because he's referring to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, if, if somebody else wrote Deuteronomy 32, or again, there's you know, this whole question of editorial activity in, in the authorship of the Torah, well, then we would loop Moses into that because obviously you know, the Israelites coming out of Egypt, are, they're going to go to Sinai, they're going to they're enter into a covenant with Yahweh. And the notion of, you know, Moses either forecasting that, you know, you're going to go after other gods or, you know, that they in fact already have, depending again on the authorship, just, you know, speaks to the issue. Recent means he's, you know, this wasn't who, you, who your fathers worshipped. It wasn't who, you know, you entered into covenant with. Who, who are these newbies? You know, that, that sort of thing. So, again, the, the answer I think is pretty more, pretty more straightforward or pretty much straightforward than, you know, the question might suggest. George from Woodsville, New Hampshire, ask, are there any female Upkalu? If not, how can Gilgamesh be two-thirds Upkalu? Well, let's take the first part. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any icon iconography or anything textually that says there were female Upkalu. That doesn't, I, I know the implication of the second part of the question, if not, how can Gilgamesh be two-thirds Upkalu? Well, if if both male and female Apkalu existed, Gilgamesh would be completely Apkalu. So that's one thing. But the reason why he's two thirds is because the post flood Apkalu, again, were in, in some cuneiform material, were uh, quote unquote of human descent. That's why you only get the two thirds. And hence the parallel to Genesis 6 1 through 4 that I've talked about in, in Unseen Realm. And, Reversing Hermon and, and the Demons book, all three of those books address the, the Apkalu context, which draws on the work of Amar Anus as far as the, the kineiform material for this. All right. Becky has a question about 1 Samuel 27, and I'm going to leave it up to you, Mike, to read the verses. But she wants to know, okay, so in the past, um, she just considered 1 Samuel 27 considered this strain from God, but now with the specific listing of the nations invaded, she wonders if this wasn't David carrying out the directions to Joshua to wipe out these nations. Yeah, I think, I think the, the verses were uh, verse, verse 8 and following. And I might as well just read those for, um, for the audience. So it says, Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For these were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as far as shore, to the land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away sheep, oxen, donkeys, camels, garments, come back to Achish, which is where he was, uh, or at least the, the, the person you know, he sort of was reporting to at this time in his life anyway. When Achish asked, where have you made a raid you know, today, David would say, oh, you know, this, that, and the other place, so on and so forth. So the, the, the rest of this we don't really need to to read. It's really those first two verses. But he, he's going up making raids against the Geshurites, Gerzites, Malachites, and then he strikes the land, would leave, leave, leave excuse me, neither man or woman alive. Uh, I, I tend to agree, you know, that uh, what we have here, this, this edit, there's an editorial comment in here. And by that, I don't necessarily mean an editorial hand. I mean, just in the text, these were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as far as shore. Okay. Um, if you recall from the Exodus series uh, in the po on the podcast, we talked about the Amalekites, and they they do have a relationship. 
to the giant clans. So th- there you have your, your clues right there. This inhabitants of the land from of old, the reference to the Amalekites. Um, their, their heritage, the Amalekites anyway, can be traced to the Horites. And, and if you want to listen to all that material, uh, it's episode uh, 283 on Exodus 17. So, you know, this, this is part, in, in that case, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a precursor to what Moses and, and later Joshua are going to run into in the land as far as, you know, opposition from the giant clans. In other words, it seeds that thought or what's going to become a recurring motif. And really, in my view, what really defines this, the rationale for, for the, the, the conquest in terms of, you know, the, the verbs of killing, you know, the, the, the cherem. The, the holy war, quote unquote, you know, those elements of the conquest are, are really about the elimination of the giant clans and those that, you know, are perceived to extend from, from the Nephilim. Now, what about the Gesherites and the Gerzites, though? So, I, again, I agree in, in principle that this is what's going on. And I think the Gesherites and the Gerzites are part of this. And there's actually a, a text critical issue that, that makes it really doubtful that this is going to sound odd, but that the Gerzites even ever existed. But let me just let me just track through. So you have two options on the Gesherites and the Gerzites, and I'm just going to read a little bit here. I looked up the uh, both terms from Anchor Bible Dictionary, and it, these were, this is actually going to be part of a presentation I gave a couple of years ago uh, in Lubbock, Texas, when I went through the the uh, the people group names. But ABD notes, quote, the inhabitants, you know, the, the Geshrites and Gerz, Gerzites were the inhabitants of an area southeast of Philistia, between Philistia and Sinai, according to Joshua 13.2. When David fled from Saul and resided in Philistia by permission of Achish, which is 1 Samuel 27, he executed forays against the Geshrites and despoiled them thoroughly. Okay. And then another note from the same source, you have uh, this ABD writes, the inhabitants of a district, Gesher, bounded on, by Gilead on the south, Bashan on the east, and Mount Hermon in the north, according to Joshua 13.11. They were Arameans who, with the Maakathites, remained Israel's neighbors on Israel's northeast extremity. So you get a connection there to the, in terms of the northern border with uh, Bashan and uh, Mount Hermon. So... Based on, taking this a little further, based on Joshua 12, 5, 13, 2, Joshua 13, 11, Joshua 13, 13, Lipinski, in, in this article, I've referenced this article before on, uh, on the podcast. This is Lipinski's article about El's abode, El, you know, the, the, the Canaanite deity, his abode, which is, he argues very, very effectively, it was originally Mount Hermon. This was the seat of the gods all the way back to, the, to Sumerian times. And of course, this is right at, at the, you know, the, the border of, of uh, Bashan, okay, the region of Bashan. So Lipinski writes, the biblical story, again, based on these passages in Joshua, implies the existence of Manassite settlements in Bashan, which should probably be linked with Jeroboam, Jeroboam II's conquests in the area. In earlier times, this region belonged at least partly to the kings of Gesher, okay, later the Aramean kingdom of Damascus, the kingdom of Gesher or Bet Maaka, extended for forty kilometers north of the Sea of Galilee. So all this this whole region, and that that much would of course would be in the land, uh, the parameters of the land that was promised uh, to Abraham and his descendants. So consequently, the Gesherites were residents in Amorite territory associated with Sion and Og of Bashan. Okay, kings of the Amorites. Uh, Og was a giant, okay, the last of the Rephaim. Though the Gesherites, in, you know, there's no verse that explicitly calls them Amorites. They, they are in this territory. This would mean that the first option, the Gesherites were inhabiting an area in the south near Philistia, is not really, you know, the, the point of the reference, you know, at least for, you know, the conquest narrative. So, so going back to the to Anchor Bible dictionaries, those two options, it's really the second one that the Gesherites were talking about uh, would, were inhabitants of a district, Gesher, again, up, up toward the north. So, you know, how do we look at this? You know, we, we've got David going after these, these Gesherites, and you, you, you could argue that there were two separate groups, one in the south, one in the north. And so, you know, a, a scholar would look at this and say, well, the, the, you know, the Gesherites, we have to keep these two groups separate, so on and so forth. But to me, that that 
actually isn't that clear because, okay, you have Gesherites in both locations. I get it. One location is very obviously associated with the giant clans. The other location, again, is, is southeast of Philistia, between Philistia and Sinai. But you get this association with the Amalekites as well. So, so you have these, these people groups, one of them, at least clearly, the Amalekites, is part of the giant clan traditions, living together. So regardless of which set of Gesherites you know, we're talking about, and if, it's, if we're talking about Akish, who's down in the south, it would be, the, it would be that group. I still think you have a connection to, to giant clan thinking and giant clan people groups. That, that this association is still, you know, still legit. It, 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 has, it has some explanatory power here. Now let's go to the Gerzites. And they're also mentioned in 1 Samuel 27, 8. Now, if the above is correct, that the Gesherites, you know, about the Gesherites and all that, you know, what, what about this other group? Well, in fact, the Gesherites may never have existed. Anchor Bible Dictionary notes this. The scholarly consensus is that the Gerzites, unknown from any other source, not, not just in the Bible, but anywhere else, okay, unknown from any other source, most probably did not exist. Already, the Masoretic text corrected the Kithiv reading, Gerzi, to the Kare reading, Gizri, okay, Gezrites meaning the inhabitants of Gezer, which also is in the north, by the way. Now, what, what, the, what that means in English, let me, let me just finish the quote. Gezer, however, lies much too far to the north to fit the context of this particular passage. Um, evidence from the Septuagint would indicate the Masoretic text reading either represents a conflate text representing two variants in Gesherites or Gerzites, Gezerites, or is the result of a ditography of Gesherites. Ditography means a, an accidental duplication of a term. Now, in English, what this means is that what the Masoretic text has, the way it's spelled, scribes themselves corrected so that it read Gezrites instead of Gerzites. The Kathiv reading is, Kathiv is a term that means what is written. In other words, what the text you know, shows you, what you're looking at in the text. And then a scribe would, would, would in the column, put a kare. This is what should be read. So here's, here's what's written. Here's what should be read. So, you know, the ancient scribal traditions actually already make this, this correction. And so, if the correction is correct, if, if we're dealing with people of Gezer, then there's no such thing as, as Gerzites, okay? They're, they're just people of Gezer. They're not some other group. So, it's, it's a, it would be a misspelling that, that has created this people group that we find in our English Bibles. Uh, again, regardless, if, if it is the, the, the Gezerites, yeah, they're, they're in the north, they're in the north, and, and they, they wouldn't, you know, they, they wouldn't really apply to, so the explanation goes, they wouldn't really apply to David's forays because David's operating in the south. Well, okay, well, how, how do we know that, that some people from, from Gezer, you know, weren't, weren't living down there as well? Well, the short answer is we don't. You don't have to have a city. You just have to have some people who this is where they come from. They happen to be there when David does these raids. And somebody takes note of it. Again, whoever's writing, you know, 1 Samuel 27, that there were people from Gezer there too. And Gezer, of course, is included in the conquest, obviously, the original, you know, conquest of the land. And because of its location in proximity to places like Bashan, uh, and, and there are other reasons that, you know, we can't really get into all this in, in, in detail in the Q&A. But there are other reasons that they, they have linkages back into this, these giant clan traditions. Um, their, their inclusion in the, in the idea, at least, still you know, deserves attention, still has some merit. So anyway, again, that, that, that's kind of a long answer to this, to really the, the, the fundamental point of the question is, is what David is doing here is a sort of a mimicking of Joshua, kind of a, a, a wiping out and a wiping up, if I can say it that way, of, of the, the conquest um, rationale, the conquest purpose in, in terms of the elimination of specific peoples because of the association with giant clans. And yeah, I think there's something to that here. Uh, and again, I think that that little line in there, these were the nations of old, okay, I, th I think is designed to, to take the reader's mind in that direction. Bob has a question, and he wants to know that scripture tells us that we will rule with Christ after his second coming. My question is, what do we rule over? 
Since the unbelievers will be in the lake of fire and believers will be rulers with Christ, what will we be responsible for ruling? Well, this is a, I, you know, I wish I had a dollar for every time I get asked this question. <laughs> uh, that could, I could get you that anniversary gift then, Trey. He asked, you'd, ha- you'd have what, like $5? Do we... <laughs> no, I'd probably have $50. Oh, okay. Um, he, he asked in the first part, what do we rule over? But then the second part of the question is really getting at who do we rule over? Those are two different things. You know, what we rule over is the earth, specifically the new earth, the new earth, the new Eden. Um, and yeah, it's going to be populated by believers, you know, with, with, with Jesus, you know, there, we, we need to stop thinking about our, our rulership in the new earth as who do I get to be the boss of, or who do I outrank, you know, and get, and get to sort of give orders in a, in a nice post-apocalyptic, uh, new Eden sort of way. Uh, you need to start thinking about the rulership in the new Eden as partnership. We are, we are there with fellow believers. We're all equal imagers of God. We are co-rulers. We are, you know, with Jesus, we are steward Kings. Basically what we're going to be doing in the, in the new earth is, you know, quote unquote, ruling over the earth, which really means we're going to be living like Adam and Eve would have lived. And of course their children had there never been a fall, you know, Genesis one twenty eight, the dominion language there, let them have dominion over the earth. It's the same lemma in, in the Septuagint, anyway, as we see in Romans fifteen twelve, where we have the, the Messiah again, and you know, looping in the rule of the Gentiles, we're granted to rule with Him in Revelation two twenty six and three twenty four. Uh, so, I, I think the whole question just needs to be reframed. That, you know, when it when it gets to the end of the eschaton, when everything plays out, we have a new global Eden. Everything is going to sort of return you know, hit the reset button to what it should have been, what it could have been without rebellion. And so we are going to be steward kings of the planet. We're going to enjoy it as it was meant to be enjoyed. And we are going to, you know, again, do the sorts of activities that Adam and Eve would have been doing in that environment together collectively as one family. So it's not that we have other people to lord over. It's that we have other people to rule with, you know, alongside of. So again, that, that's the short answer to that. There's a lot in there to unpack, obviously, but that's the, that, that, that's the short answer to, I think, a, a, a very reasonable question and, and a very common one. So does that mean I got to start working out if we're going to be like Adam and Eve or <laughs> are we going to have clothes? Because I need to start working out. You know, yeah, there, there you go. Yeah. No yeah, it, 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 it figures you'd, you'd, you'd pull something like that right out of the answer. <laughs> so, so you're telling me we're a bunch of nudists. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll say, I'll say your, your glorified body will probably take care of that. That's awesome. You know, and, and if we want to get silly theological, you know, Jesus, when he when in his resurrected body, he had new clothing too, that he didn't have before. So you'll probably get new clothing anyway. So I don't think you need to worry about that. We'll, we'll, right. we'll still know it's you. Well, I'll probably be in. If the you want a better body, section. maybe you'll have one, but we'll still know it's you, yeah. unless you want to be a nudist. I guess you know. Yeah. I'm, then you can. You're on your own there, Trey. I'll be going. <laughs> I'll be going. Oh, gee, me and me and Adam. You know, we'll be down by yeah, the I, beach. I think. I think the Lord will up. just. I think the Lord will just take one look at you and say, "Well, there's always one of those in the crowd." You know, it's yeah. just what are you going to do? Yeah. There's always somebody like that. All right. Well, looking forward to it. even here. Yeah. Well, looking forward to it. <laughs> Our first one is from Briar. Briar asks about the ancient Assyrians were at times in their history somewhat monotheistic. They worshipped a god named Ashur, who in the oldest myths has no genealogy, unlike the gods of Mesopotamia or Canaan. Are there any connections that can be made with the Yahweh of Israel and Ashur of the Assyrians? Also, just out of curiosity, Since they share similar symbolism, i.e. the bearded figure mounted on a pair of wings, can connections also be made between Ashur and Ahura Mazda of Zoroastrian religion, and thus between Ahura Mazda and Yahweh? I'm curious to know if other ancient cultures might have worshipped the one true God like Israel did. Well, you know, the, the Bible certainly presents the human story this way, that it originally... 
humanity as a collective, you, you know, had a knowledge of the one true God and so on and so forth. This gets altered, you know, at Babel, post Babel and whatnot. Um, so we, we, on one hand, we shouldn't be surprised if there's sort of vestigial ideas that would extend from an original monotheism, you know, onward. By the way, if, if you're interested in this, uh, this topic, there's a, there's actually a book on it by, uh, Winifred Corduan, C-O-R-D-U-A-N. Uh, he's a philosopher of religion, um, and, I, and I believe you know evangelical orientation. Um, but he has uh, he has a book on this. And just in case you're interested, again, from a philosophical sort of you know historical uh, perspective. Again, he's not a, a biblical scholar, but it's still kind of a major you know work on this idea, at least probing it. Now, having said all that. The specifics of the question, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of, uh, with with Ashur and the Assyrians and Ahura Mazda and so on and so forth. The reason is a, a lot of the, the talk about the Assyrians in this regard, and I, and I know the 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 question was worded, I think, appropriately, somewhat monotheistic. I think that that certainly is the best way you could describe the situation. But a lot of this talk stems from the work of Simo uh, Parpola, who was a cuneiform specialist, um, you know, a scholar of Assyriology. Uh, I, I don't know that he's still alive. He probably is. But he published uh, a few things that sort of promoted this idea, um, specifically uh, two books. I'm just going to give the titles here. So that uh, if you're interested in this, you could, you know, reference them or look them up. One is called The Assyrian Tree of Life, Tracing the Origins of Jewish Monotheism and Greek Philosophy. Um, again, this is, you know, sort of a, a, it's kind of a major work. Assyrian Prophecies, 1997 is a little later, and that's sort of a full um, expression. The first thing, the first one is a journal article. And the second one, four years later, is a book called Assyrian Prophecies. Now, again, this is the where a lot of this discussion derives from and really revolves around. Now, the problem is Parpola's work in this regard has not been, I, I can't even say it, it hasn't been widely accepted. It hasn't been basically accepted by most anybody. So it's very idiosyncratic. And there have been lengthy reviews uh, of of this that really calls the the methodology and, and the conclusions into question. Um, I'm going to I'm going to mention two of these, and these are going to be in the protected folder for people who subscribe to my newsletter. The first one is by Gerald Cooper. It's C O O P E R. Cooper was for many years uh, an Assyriologist, and he taught Akkadian and Sumerian at Johns Hopkins University. He reviews the book Assyrian Prophecies, the Assyrian Tree and Mesopotamian Origins of you know Jewish. Well, let me let me just give you his title of the title of his review, and it kind of tells you where he's going. Assyrian Prophecies, the Assyrian Tree, the Mesopotamian Origins of Jewish Monotheism, Greek Philosophy, Christian Theology, Gnosticism, and much more. <laughs> so there's a, there's a little tinge of, of sarcasm there, but basically he this is a 16 page book review, which is kind of unusual pretty long. But he goes through Parpola's ideas pretty systematically and basically says, I'm not buying it. So his abstract concludes this way, this review article, while concurring with that some roots of these phenomena may indeed be found in ancient Mesopotamia, disagrees strongly with the author's methodology and conclusions. So Again, he's not buying what Parpola is selling. The other article that I'm going to put in the protected folder is by John Hilber. Now, Hilber has been a guest on this podcast before. Uh, he we, Most recently, we, we talked about his book, uh, Divine Accommodation and Metaphor. Uh, now, John, you know, since Parpola is writing, you know, the title of his book, Assyrian Prophecies, John is, is somebody for his dissertation and you know basically his ongoing research has spent a lot of time in this material neo assyrian prophetic prophecy stuff okay prophecy again not like what we think of an end times prophecy but prophecy is like the role of prophets okay and he did a paper in 
2010 at ETS. And I have the paper. And again, this is what's going to be uploaded. So I have some notes scribbled in this paper. I just, you know, I scanned it, you know, so that uh, I could upload it and you could have it. I don't know if you can read my writing or not, but what, you know, the important part of the content is actually John's paper. And it's titled Monotheism in Neo-Assyrian Religion, question mark, an appraisal. So this is a nine page, again, survey of what Parpola is arguing for. And again, he's, John is also not persuaded. Uh, and th- the same kinds of problems. Um, you know, they're, they're just sort of, you know, guesses. There are some method- methodological issues. Sometimes you need to define this or that term in a specific way. You know, Parpola does for his idea to work. Again, there there are just some problems. There's some significant problems with what Parpola is trying to argue. So, because I'm aware that this idea is at best tenuous, I don't want to say that we can draw any connections between Yahweh and Ashur of the Assyrians. Specifically, I'm, I'm going with with the 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 trajectory of the question here. Specifically, in regard to monotheism or the uh, you know the, the status of Yahweh and Ashur within their respective you know theological systems, uh, because I just don't think we're on secure ground to do that. Now, when it comes to Ahura Mazda and Yahweh Zoroastrianism, that as well, it is far from certain that Zoroastrianism was monotheistic. This is actually a big fight within the rather small uh, community that specializes in Zoroastrianism, you know, Persian religion. One of these people is uh, Ed Yamauchi. Uh, Yamauchi is now retired. He taught at the University of Miami in Ohio uh, in the history department. He's a specialist in ancient Persia. And he has a really nice book, uh, Persia and the Bible. It was published by Baker back in 1996. And so uh, I think you know, this is a, this is a good place to go. I'm going to read a few things about, um, the issues with Ahura Mazda and and this whole monotheism thing. So Yamauchi writes this, he says, associated with Ahura Mazda were six Amesha Spentas or bounteous immortals who are conceived as semi-personal manifestations of the Supreme God. The six are Asha, which means righteousness, Vahumana, good mind, Kshatra, power, Armaiti, suitable disposition, Harvatat, health, and Ameritat, immortality. Yamauchi says, these appear to be personified abstractions, but they were more than abstractions because they were venerated by Zoroaster. So let's just stop there with that first paragraph. So you certainly don't have anything like this in, in biblical thought where other, we'll just call them members of the heavenly host, other divine beings, you know, are going to be venerated or, or, or worshipped or something like this. Um, I mean, you do have a, a, a Trinitarian system. Uh, maybe you have a, like a double Trinitarian. But the, the, the way Zoroastrian material talks about these six is not the way the Bible would be thinking about a Godhead like co-equal, co-eternal, none of that is, is on, on, you know, on, on the board here. This is, this sounds actually more like Sethian Gnosticism, Gnostic cosmology with the, you know, the, the aeons, you know, the, the coming from the true God. And when they, when they are collectivized, they either play realm of the fullness of the true God and all that. It, it sounds more like that than it does, you know, real Trinitarianism or, or, or Godhead thinking in the Bible. Back to Yamauchi, he says, the concept of the immortals is one of the most important and original doctrines of Zoroaster. They are prominent in the Gathas, which state explicitly, the Gathas, by the way, are are written text for Zoroastrianism. They are prominent in the Gathas, which state explicitly that Ahura Mazda created the first four immortals. So so these immortals have a beginning. Okay, that's quite different than Godhead thinking, but again, back to Yamauchi. Each of the immortals is associated with some aspect of creation. Vohumana with animals, Asha with fire, Kshatra with metals, Ar- Armaiti with earth, Harvatat with water, and Ameritat with plants. In later times, the Amesha Spentas, again, these six bounteous immortals, were transformed into male and female deities. Armaiti became the spouse of Ahura Mazda. 
the Parsis, the, the Persians, okay, now regard the immortals as archangels. So their, their doctrine has evolved a bit. Many leading scholars believe Zoroaster taught not a monotheism, but a dualism with two primordial uncreated spirits, a good spirit that is God and an evil spirit. Now, again, if that's the case, and again, there's still, there's even uncertainty there. You'd have two uncreated spirits. Again, the, that, that doesn't align well with biblical thought as well, because there's only one uncreated being, right? And of course, it's not, you know, oppositional. We don't have two in this dualistic system. Willard Oxtoby defines dualism as, quote, a conception of the universe which postulates two ultimate principles seen as opposed to each other and more or less evenly matched, unquote. A key text is Yasna 30, verse 3, quote, now these two spirits, which are twins, revealed themselves at first in a vision, unquote. So that's the end of, you know, Yamauchi's uh, section. I've also put up in the in the protected folder uh, an article by Almut Hintze, which is entitled Monotheism, the Zoroastrian Way. It's from the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society, volume 24, number two, April 2014. So it's fairly recent. And again, that article kind of describes the same sorts of things, uh, but there's there's more detail to it. So this really doesn't align very well. Um, a lot of what you'll read in, in, on Zoroastrianism would, would ba- basically comes down to this, this notion of, well, yeah, it's, it's kind of monotheistic except where it isn't. <laughs> um, you know, so you have this tension and again, scholars still to this day disagree on how to characterize it. So the uncertainty of it doesn't really make it a good platform for comparison. Our next question is from Marion in New Mexico. What is Mike's opinion on the lost chapter of Acts found in Constantinople? Well, not much. Uh, Basically, I don't know how else to say it. Basically, this is British Israelite nonsense. Um, You know, I, I did a search for, you know, Acts 29 in Constantinople in Google Scholar. And, and there's like next to nothing in that. I, I have a digital library with over 30,000 volumes and I got zero hits. That's extraordinarily unusual. What that means is that basically scholars don't give this the time of day. And if you actually go out on the, on the web and read about this, quote, lost chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, you're sort of going to discover why. <laughs> you know, why it's just yeah, we have better things to do, you know, sort of stuff. So this is known, this lost chapter is known as the Sanini Manuscript, um, basically because of where it's talked about. It's a short text that, again, supposedly is the, is the last, the missing last chapter of Acts. And it details Paul's journey to Britannia, where he preached to a tribe of Israelites on Ludgate Hill, okay, in, in, in Britannia. It's British Israelism, okay, which, which is nonsense for a, a host of reasons. And, you know, people have published, I mean, I have in my, in my paranormal collection here, my, my fringe pop collection in my library, I've got several, you know, older books and, you know, some, a, you know, a few recent things on British Israelite religion. You know, that's what it is. It's, it's almost a cult, really that more or less just tears this apart. Um, so that's really why nobody pays any attention to it. If you wanted a little bit more uh, for a description, you could go up to, uh, just go up to Google and put the name Edward Goodspeed. Okay, just spelled just like it sounds. His last name is Goodspeed. He was a Greek scholar and theologian uh, in the early, mid, early to mid 20th century. And he actually has a, a bit of a write-up on the 29th chapter of Acts. And I'm going to, I'm going to read a little bit from it, but if you wanted, uh, again, good speeds take, this is just so hard to find anything on. So the fact that you can find even this much is, you know, really noteworthy because most people just don't have any time for this, this sort of stuff. So good speed writes, For many years, there has prevailed in certain quarters in England the idea that the Anglo-Saxon peoples are the the lost ten tribes of Israel, 
who were carried into captivity by Assyria in 722 BC and have never been heard of since. The holders of this British Israel position declare that the national seal of the United States bears witness to our identity with the tribe of Manasseh, the 13th tribe, while the royal arms of Britain recall those of Ephraim and Judah. George Washington and King George V are in fact lineal descendants of King David. Like who knew? And elsewhere he writes, one of the most interesting claims is the discovery of the 29th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, again, so-called. This long lost chapter of the Acts of Apostles contained the account of Paul's journey in Spain and Britain. It is said by a recent publisher of it, Mr. T.G. Cole, to have been translated by the Oriental traveler C.S. Sanini from, quote, a Greek manuscript found in the archives at Constantinople and presented to him by the Sultan Abdul Ahmed, unquote. Sanini's translation, we are further informed, quote, was found interleaved in a copy of Sanini's Travels in Turkey and Greece and purchased at the sale of the library and effects of the late Wright, Honorable Sir John Newport in Ireland, in whose possession it had been for more than 30 years with a copy of the Firman of the Sultan of Turkey granting to C.S. Sanini permission to travel in all parts of the Ottoman dominions. Basically, he goes on and basic, you know, and says, look, there isn't a single Greek text, there isn't a single Greek fragment of the book of Acts that has the stuff that's supposedly in Acts 29 in it. In other words, there's no primary source data. You know, when you, when you get things like this found in libraries, lost away, tucked, you know, used as a bookmark for something else, you know, that honestly, that's been done before. <laughs> by forgers you know it's it's not a it, it this is, isn't like a single occurrence of this sort of thing you know and so w- without you know that and and you know people by this by this point have gone to tr- to constantinople and asked hey you know like is is this did this come from this and did you guys ever you know have have this in your archives or you know is there any like record of this and you know, it's no 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 and no you know it there's just nothing to go on here and the fact that it's rooted in the mythology of British Israelite uh, thinking, again, answers the question why you can do these broad database searches and nothing comes up. Again, no one has considered it even worth time to look at it. So I don't think a whole lot of it. Ghostman wants to know, what is the meaning of Ecclesiastes 321? Well, let's let's read the verse first so that um, people listening get a feel for this. So Ecclesiastes 3.21 says, let me just I should back up a little bit, get a little context here. Verse 18, I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. I mean, er everything dies, okay? They all have the same breath, the same life force in them. Man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. Now, here's verse 21. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. Okay, so out of the gate, In that context, what verse 21 is asking is, who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward, like to God, returns to God, and the spirit of the beast doesn't. Because everything dies. Everything surrenders its spirit. But who knows, you know, if, if, you know, know, humans are going to, you know, have have an everlasting destiny with with their creator, and animals don't. I mean, who, who knows? So just generally... The, the verse kind of in context tells you really what, what the question being asked is. Now, I often get asked, you know, what, about commentaries. And for Ecclesiastes, my, my sort of go-to sources are Tremper Longman's commentary, the book of Ecclesiastes. It's part of the New International Commentary in the Old Testament. It's 1998. Erdman's. And, and Tremper, his specialty is wisdom literature. And the other one is Ian Provan. This is the NIV application commentary. Uh, it's a commentary on Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs. 
And I'm going to read a bit from uh, Provence in this case um, about these verses. He actually has a, a, a fairly lengthy discussion of this. So here we go. He writes, here in Ecclesiastes 3, 18 through 22, however, the emphasis falls on the apparent lack of distinction between humans and animals rather than between the wise and the foolish in death. Again, everything dies. God enables human beings to see that in respect of their ultimate fate, quote, that they are like the animals, 318, unquote. The similarity of human beings to the animals in this crucial respect is underlined in the fivefold use of Hebrew kol, which means all, in verses 3, or verses 19 and 20, which reads, all have the same breath. Everything is meaningless. Right? All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return, unquote. So Provence says that all sentient life is comprised of the dust of the ground and the breath, ruach, again, often translated spirit, but same word for for breath or wind, that all sentient life is comprised of dust of the ground and breath of life placed together by God and destined to be separated at death is the common view expressed or implied in the Old Testament. Kohelet, and that's the the writer of Ecclesiastes, that's the Hebrew term for the, the preacher, Kohelet does not commit himself to any particular view on what happens after death in verse 21, although he is clearly familiar with the idea that when the human body and the breath slash spirit are separated, the spirit, that spirit, does not go down with the body into the, into the earth as is the case of animals, but rather rises upward, presumably to God. His stance is agnostic, though. Who knows, he asks. He cannot be certain what will happen after death, and he asked the same question in 2.19. Because it is unseen, he rests content with that which, in the grace of God, he has come to see. Namely, that death renders pointless during life the quest for gain or advantage over the rest of creation. So again, it goes back to this all is vanity. You know, we're all going to die. I mean, it, if you've read Ecclesiastes, this is going to sound real familiar. Which is why the book ends, you know, that this is, the, this is the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep his commandments. You know, because ultimately, you know, our, 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 our destiny after death is going to be in the hands of God. So that's basically his take on this. And so when he asked in verse 21, who knows? Again, he's, he's, he's basically saying, I, I don't really know what happens, you know, like, like after we die, you know, and, and in the Old Testament, as we, we've had episodes on this before, specifically the songs of um, the Psalms of Korah and some of the other Korahite uh, things in the Old Testament, you do have a, a widespread notion that every, everybody dies, the righteous die, the wicked die, they all go to the same place, they all go to the underworld, the realm of the dead, so on and so forth. But there's this hope in various texts that the righteous will be taken out of Sheol out of the underworld, you know, to be with the Lord. Now, you know, this is an idea that's going to you know, get a lot more attention, you know, later, you know, in the Second Temple period, New Testament, so on and so forth. But the hope was that this, this is the destiny of the righteous, that they don't stay there. So this, this is what prompts the question, this, this sort of ambiguity or uncertainty. But it, it, it would be saying too much to say that the Old Testament does not have a hope of the pa- positive afterlife. That's an overstatement that you'll often hear. Um, and people will often go to passages like this, you know, but then they, they'll skip the Psalms and other places that, that say the opposite, you know, that do express a clear hope. So th- this is where he's at. He doesn't know. And if you read, again, Ecclesiastes, he basically goes through all these questions of life and all the facets of life and basically shows that you know, all is vanity because we're all going to die. And in the end, you know, what, we, what we need to do is we need to be on the Lord's side. We need to be righteous. We fear God and keep his commandments. And then we, you know, our, our destiny is in his hands. So in a nutshell, I mean, that's really the thought he's expressing here. Um, it, it's very much in concert with kind of Old Testament thinking about the afterlife to, to wonder, you know, to at least express the question, but also, you know, express the hope. Ghostman has one more question. Mike said before that 1,000 years is too short for the millennium, the global Eden. What does he make of the new heavens and earth? Is that just part of the global Eden or something later? Well, I think that the new earth is the new global Eden. You know, the, the new heaven and earth, you know, again, that, 
just that phrase borrows the language of Genesis 1. It's the totality of material creation that can be experienced in some way by humans. I mean, even outer, we can, we can see the heavens, you know, we can, we may not be able to live there or live in the sea, but we can, we can see these things. So we experience the heavens and the earth, at, at least in some way. So this is an expression of the totality of creation, again, that, that humans can experience with their senses. All of that is made new. So that is the new global Eden. That is, th- those two things are interchangeable. The, the new heavens and new earth is the global, you know, Edenic situation. Um, because we're going to be on a new earth. The, the new, you know, the heavens are recreated with the earth. And it's just a way of expressing everything, you know, the reset button gets hit. Everything goes back to the way God originally made it, except now Eden isn't just a little piece of turf on the earth. It's the whole earth. All right. Charles has our last two questions. And the first one is, I feel the more I listen to your work, the more I wonder about people asking saints to pray for them, lighting candles to honor saints and praying through images, etc., being a form of idolatry. I used to not think much of that and heard that the church had sanctioned that in a seventh ecumenical council. I know you tend to eschew traditions and talk about a text-driven theology. In your study, would the Apostle Paul have thought of these practices as a sin? Yes, part of the idolatry question, you know, really depends on what's going on inside a person's head and their heart. I know Christian traditions like Catholicism, they they do make a distinction between veneration and worship, which to Protestants just sounds like, well, those are just two different words that mean the same thing. But 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 Catholics really do make a distinction. If you read Catholic theology, you know, they're they're going to to articulate the difference in ways that would satisfy them, okay? But setting that aside, you know, the, the whole idolatry question, I, you know, I, I just don't think that, that Paul is going to have any room for, certainly not for worshiping, and again, what's the difference with veneration? Uh, anything that isn't God, okay? I mean, even angels in Scripture tell people not to venerate them, not to worship them. Of course, you know, again, Catholicism is going, to, is going to try to parse these passages and put one in, in, the, in the worship bucket, the other one in the veneration bucket. But, but to me, that, that's pretty telling, you know, that, that, you know, but they don't do that. Peter, you know, when, when the, the, you know, there's, a, there's an episode where someone bows down to Peter, he says, rise, I'm also a man. You know, it just, I, 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 th- I think there's just very little room for this. Now, Having said that, you know, how, how how is this justified? Again, I don't think there's a real good scriptural justification for any of this, but that's typically not what you find. It, you don't find these things in, in Catholic theology justified with exegesis or scripture. Rather, these things are justified with, with what we might call theological logic. For example, praying to Mary. The, the reasoning is, well, what son, Jesus, you know, one wouldn't... Uh, you know, what son would deny his mother's request? So Jesus, of course, is going to answer prayers delivered to him by his mother. Well, okay, I see the theological logic, but could I have a verse, please, that we're supposed to pray to Mary? And again, in this case, you know, there, there's some kind of mediation, you know, going on with, with saints. I mean, it's, it's the same kind of logic with saints, um, whether they're depicted with icons or not. Um, you know, it might be borrowing from the concept of angelic mediation in the Old Testament, the idea that saints, you know, departed believers now are angels now or something like that. In the Old Testament, some of the angels were called mediators, and that's true. But of course, that ignores passages like, you know, in 1 Timothy 2, where, you know, Christ is the only mediator between God and men. It has to ignore that. But there might be some of that going on. But you know, lest you lest anybody out there think that this is a caricature, I'm going to read a selection from a a, a Catholic theology, and this is an older. I, I deliberately picked an older one, so it's like pre-Vatican II and all that stuff. This is like traditional Catholicism. This is Joseph Barrington and John Kirk, the faith of Catholics, confirmed by Scripture and attested by the fathers of the first five centuries of the Church. It's 1885. It's, it's, a, it's a multi-volume work. So they write this, Catholics are persuaded that the angels and saints in heaven, replenished with charity, pray for us, 
the fellow members of the latter here on earth, that they rejoice in our conversion, that they see in God, or that seeing God, they see and know in him all things suitable to their happy state, and that God may be inclined to hear their request made in our, on our behalf, and for their sakes may grant us many favors. Therefore, we believe it, it is good and profitable to invoke their intercession. Can this manner of invocation be more injurious to Christ, our mediator, than it is for one Christian to beg the prayers of another here on earth? Now, let, let's take that, that paragraph apart. So you have angels in heaven, and they're happy. They're happy dudes because they're in heaven. And they're, they're thrilled when, when humans become believers. Okay? And, and they see God and they know that, you know, God's character is part of why they're happy. There's all things suitable to their happy estate. And so that would automatically mean that God is inclined to hear the requests of angels or saints made on the behalf of the living. Again, it, it's all this, I think these are, I think this is a non sequitur, okay? I mean, it, it makes certain assumptions. It builds an argument based upon a logical string of of thoughts, but again, could could I have a verse, please? Now, in the book, there are passages that are sort of cited for this. I'm gonna let me give you a few of these. So let's go to Luke 15:10. Just so I tell you that there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Okay, the angels are happy when a sinner repents. Where does that verse tell me that I should pray to them? You know, it doesn't. Okay, we're in the book of Revelation. There are several passages in Revelation that are going to be looped into this. Revelation 1, 4 and 5, okay? Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Wow, there, there's, there's spirits. There's spiritual beings before the throne of God. Yeah, yeah, there are. That would be logical. They're part of God's entourage. Again, where does it say we're supposed to pray to them or that we can? Revelation 8, 3 and 4 says, you know, let, let, might as well just go there here. Revelation 8, 3 and 4. Another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. and He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. So this angel, again, has this, you know, he's at the altar, he has this thing full of incense, and the, and the smoke of the incense symbolizes the prayers of the saint, the prayers of the, uh, yeah, the saints, the holy ones, okay, going up to God. Again, where does it say that the angel is the object of these prayers? I mean, wh why can't this just be symbolizing, you know, what's going on here? Now, you can talk about angelic priesthood. That's a, that's certainly a, a legitimate idea from both Old Testament, again, the, media, the mediatorial idea, and then in the second temple period where you get the angelic priesthood with the human priesthood, and, you know, again, the whole idea of humans being grafted back into the divine council. Again, the, these are biblical ideas, but what's missing from them, what's missing from them, I mean, the, the priestly language is there because we render service to God in God's house. That's why there's priestly language. What's missing from all these descriptions is the notion that humans can pray to these lesser beings and these lesser beings mediate the prayers to God. Again, to me, this, this idea ignores Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 and 1 Timothy 2, 5. So Hebrews 4, 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, now, you could say, well, that, that doesn't say that we're, we're drawing near to God and praying directly to God. Well, it, okay, it's the throne of grace, singular throne, like who would be on it? And again, you have the high priestly language here. Which, which, you know, again, mimes this, this, this Day of Atonement thing. And who's the high priest? Well, that would be Jesus. It's not an angel. It's not one of these lesser beings. So my question is, if Jesus has this role now of high priest, the, the highest mediator that there, there could be between God, and the verse says, let us draw, you know, let us draw near with confidence. 
why do I need to pray to some, some guy who was here and died as holy as he was or whoever? Why, why do I need to do that? There, there just doesn't seem to be any coherence to the idea. And then, you know, you get to first Timothy, first Timothy two, five, for there is one God and there's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Again, that, that would be the high priest of Hebrews 4. Now, if you'll notice in the paragraph, it says the, 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 person, the people who wrote the paragraph anticipate you know, the one mediator passage, and they write this. Can this manner of invocation, you know, praying to, to saints and stuff, be more injurious to Christ our mediator than it is for one Christian to beg the prayers of another here on earth? So in other words, if, if I'm, you know, when I ask you to pray for me, and Jesus isn't offended by that. The, art, the logic is, well, we should be able to ask saints to, to pray for us too. And, and Jesus wouldn't be offended at that. And do you see the problem? You know, when we ask someone to pray f- on our behalf, you know, is that really the same as, as praying to, you know, gosh, to a dead person? All right, it just... <laughs> it, it, you know, I'm 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 tempted to use the the, the necromancy, you know, the, the N word here, but you know that, that that's saying a little bit too much. But again, there's no verse for this. It's theological logic. So, I mean, if if you're Catholic, you know, in the audience, and 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 you're thinking of it on these terms, okay? Well, just like I would ask somebody to pray for me, and and that that person's going to pray to God on my behalf, and Obviously, God's not going to be offended by that because we're supposed to pray for one another. The New Testament says this. Therefore, logically, I should be able to pray to to dead believers who have gone on and they're with the Lord. I should be able to pray for them, and then assuming that that they will they will do that, and God will will hear my prayers. Again, we have a verse for one: pray for one another. We don't have a verse for the for the dead side of it. But it, but if this is how you're thinking about it, to me that that isn't worshiping a saint. I don't think it's coherent theology, but I don't think you've crossed a line to idolatry. And again, the, the question is, what would Paul think? I think Paul would probably think, well, what are you doing? Like like like, don't you know that Jesus is our high priest? Why not? You know, go directly to the Lord. You know why? Why? Why are we doing this? And, and again, you have the, the angelic refusal, you know, of, of, of worship, you know, okay. And you say, well, this isn't worship. This is off, you know, asking the angel or whoever to pray for me. Again, I, I hope you see the distinction between sort of veneration and, or, or at least this idea of, of using dead believers and, and angels or whatever as intercessors. I, I hope you see the logic and therefore I hope you see the difference between that and worship because that, that's important. But my problem is, is I, we do have scripture for one side of it, asking people to pray for us. We don't have scripture for the other. That is an inference that's drawn, you know, through theological logic. And this is consistently how you see this idea defended. You know, again, if if I want my theology to be biblical, I'd like Bible, you know, for it. I, I don't think that's an unreasonable request. I really don't. So that's why I I, I tend to have a, a a negative view of this, but I think it probably goes too far if someone is thinking the, the thoughts that I just you know sketched out, if they're thinking of of what they're doing in in, in practical terms, like like you would think of asking a, a, a you know a living human being to pray for you, if that's what you're doing, well that that, that you know I don't, I don't think we can call that worship. It's something else but I, I don't think there's really biblical support for it. So uh, you know, idolatry, I think, might be too harsh uh, you know, of, of a way to characterize this. But if you're thinking maybe about it some different way, maybe, you know, maybe that is a problem. I don't know. It just depends, like I said at the beginning of this question, what, what's kind of floating through a person's head uh, when, they're, when they're engaged in this sort of thing. Charles' second question is, I heard a part of Augustine's commentary on John chapter 6 read by a Reformed preacher that seemed to match up well with what you yourself said on the Naked Bible podcast back on early episodes on the Lord's Supper. It seems some of the divine counsel material is in some way present in the writings of the early church fathers. Yet the two traditions, Orthodox and Roman Catholic, 
that love to quote the early church fathers as authorities would also despise your comments on both the Lord's Supper and baptism. At the same time, the Reformed tradition and even some of the new perspective groups seem entirely ignorant of the divine council theology. For someone who has struggled with Catholicism, and yet is not always entirely satisfied by the Reformed tradition, how can I have a stable and balanced approach to my relationship with God? I would say the the only way to really do this is to divorce your relationship with God from those traditions. What I mean by that is don't define your relationship with God as requiring endorsement of any one tradition or don't let it be dictated by any one tradition. There's no reason to do that. These are all post-biblical traditions. Why should they set the rules for you on your relationship with God as opposed to letting Scripture set the rules for you on your relationship with God? Scripture preceded all of these traditions. It's also inspired, okay, where these traditions are not. And again, it, it, I don't want maybe newcomers to the podcast to think like I'm, I'm anti-tradition. I don't spend any time shooting uh, on this podcast or you know, anywhere where I go lecture. I don't spend any time shooting at denominations. I also don't spend any time endorsing them. They, they are what they are. They are post-biblical human exercises and efforts to transmit Christian, you know, Christian teaching. Okay. And they, they all have something to contribute. They all have something that just makes me cringe, you know, but again, they, they are what they are. And, you know, I, I, you know, trying to you know, be as charitable as I can here. I think, I think the, the goal is, you know, for most people who are serious in all these traditions, I'm not talking about the people who use Christian office and ministry office and denominational this and that for power. Okay. Those people you can write off. Okay. That, that, that's just, that is antithetical to servanthood. It's antithetical to discipleship. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the people who are really sincere and serious. They want to know the Lord. Okay. And so those people within these traditions, you know, they, their hearts in the right place, their tradition will, will, you know, again, there'll, there'll be things that are are just going to conform really well to Scripture. There's going to be things that don't, you know. But but all the traditions are trying to do the same thing in, in, in this in, again in the sincere bucket to to have people know the Lord and, and walk with God and become disciples of Jesus. They just are what they are. Everybody has hits and misses, you know. So I I don't I don't feel any sense of either moral obligation or theological obligation or personal obligation. A practical obligation to have to pick one. I, I don't. I don't know what where the cosmic rule is that says I have to pick one. So I don't. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. I'd rather try to understand the text, the thing that trumps all of those things, the thing that preceded, the thing that actually is inspired. I'd rather try to understand that and use that as you know the, the sandbox, you know, so to speak, to play in or. or you know, the, the, the laboratory in which to in, engage and, and try to figure out, you know, what, what the Lord wants and how I should live. You know, I, I, that's, what can I say, you know, without becoming too repetitious? I mean, that, that, that's my advice to you. Divorce your relationship with God from endorsing or being, you know, having it dictated to you by any tradition. You know, I could, I could walk into a, a whole bunch of different churches and, and get something out of it. You know, and chances are I could walk into those same churches and, and you know, cringe on any given Sunday too. You know, it, 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 it just is what it is. It's where, it's where humanity is at, you know, that, that again, giving them the benefit of the doubt. Everybody's trying to do the same thing. You're going to have hits and misses. So your, your, your walk with the Lord shouldn't be something that is sort of malleable by, by your, your, you know, your experience on any given Sunday. I mean, you should, you should be able to, you know, hear what's being preached in some place and, you know, Lord willing, it actually has some orientation to scripture or, or see a liturgy and understand it. You know, that, that, that should, that should help you in thinking about your relationship to God and and being a disciple of Jesus. It should, it should help you in some way. You should get something out of it, no matter where you're at. Uh, again, I, I realize we live in a bizarre day, so 
I, I can't guarantee that, but I hope you get the, the, the spirit of the comment. Your relationship with God should be something that's, that's working in you internally that is not dictated by your external experiences in places, you know, that we call churches. Okay. Those things can help. They can hinder. All right. Realize that. But ultimately it's between you and the Lord. All right. And that, that's where that, that's the boots on the ground place where all of this should be happening. And so that, again, that's my advice. Don't, don't link your relationship with the Lord to any tradition. Uh, no, all we got is uh, our first question, Mike, and uh, it's about Ezekiel three seventeen through 21. And uh, Jordan, Jordan says, I often hear pastors quote passages like Ezekiel three seventeen through 21 to try and motivate Christians to evangelize more often. Does this passage actually show that for at least some unbelievers out there, if someone witnesses to them, they would believe the gospel and go to heaven? But if no one witnesses them, they would go to hell. In other words, is their fate my fault? Yeah, this this question sort of, well, it, it almost, it's going to sound a little odd, but it reflects kind of a poor theology of God. And, and that might sound, like I said, a little bit odd, but let me try to unpack it. Let, I'll just say, first of all, I don't, I don't see how the passage applies specifically to evangelism at all. And I should probably read it, you know, just so people are are aware of what it is we're talking about here. So this is Ezekiel 3, 17. Uh, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity. But you will have delivered your soul. So it's the Watchman passage. Uh, again, some people probably kind of knew where this was, you know, angling for right away. But it's good to just read it. I, I you know, the, the passage doesn't specifically apply to evangelism, if we want to read it in, in context anyway. So. You know, there, there's that. And, you know, God doesn't, why would we think God puts all his eggs into one basket? You know, God is not so inept to tie his own hands, as it were, you know, in, in regard to someone's salvation or even someone's repentance. What I mean by that is he's not going to bind something he desires. God is not going to bind something he desires, the salvation of a lost person, to one Christian's obedience. Why would we even think that? It's like, you know, do we really believe that God says, oh, too bad that that one Christian failed. You're toast now. You know, we're done here. You're, you know, welcome to hell. I mean, it, it, really? I mean, is, is this how we think about God's interest in humanity? That, 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 you know, any person's, you know, destiny, their eternal destiny is tied to one individual Christian and perhaps one encounter? And if there's a failure there, then there's, there's no hope for that person. You know, I I would suggest to you that, that if somebody's thinking that way, you should look back on your own life and realize that that isn't the way God drew you either. You know, it's never this one and done sort of thing, but that's why I said it it kind of reflects poorly on, on the doctrine of God or, or what we, how we think about God. Now, you know, I'll be, I'll be more charitable here. You know, the thought at least counts, you know, the, the, a pastor who would be, you know, trying at least to, to preach from Ezekiel 3, you know, and, and okay, as an application, a point of application from Ezekiel 3, yeah, we should speak to lost people. But again, the circumstances here overstate the context of the passage for sure. And, you know, it, it could descend into something manipulative or at the very, maybe at you know, I hate to say it this way, but at best, it's just teaching a theology that limits God, which is pretty bad. So what the passage means is actually answered in verse 17. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So there's the context. It's right in the verse. Now, some, you know, commentators uh, like Dan Block, and we used his commentary a lot in our series on Ezekiel, take this statement as a as retrospective. 
sort of like son of man, I, I made you, or I, I, I did make you, or I had made you a watchman for the house of Israel because he's equally, you remember is it, he's in Babylon. He's there with the captives. And so some scholars take it as the job that Ezekiel was doing before he was he himself was taken captive. So those who take this you know perspective would say that the words reflect what Ezekiel was doing before you know Jerusalem fell, before his own captivity. Um, it's probably a better way to say it because Jerusalem's going to fall while he's in captivity. But this this is what Ezekiel was supposed to be doing. He's doing the job of warning the people of Judah to repent. Now he's in Babylon with everybody else, and others say, you know, no, 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 you know, it's not retrospective. Other commentators will say the wording here reflects his mission in Babylon. And honestly, this one actually makes more sense to me. And, and what it would be, the way we would understand it is something like this. Ezekiel's message now that they're in Babylon, he's with the, this, this bunch of captives, is simply don't defy God or you'll die. Just like the people I was warning back home before all this happened to us. So yeah, you know, Ezekiel was responsible for them back in, in the, you know, God's land. He was God's prophet. There were no other prophets among the captives by the Kabar Canal once they get into Babylon. So yeah, Ezekiel had a responsibility back home. He has a responsibility here. He's God's mouthpiece. You know, he was in, in his circumstances, the only link that people had to God. So is, you know, is it really fair though, to put ourselves in that situation? Are you really the only person, you know, that, that is, is a person's link to, you know, the truth or something like that? It's kind of hard to say, you know, in, in, a, in a modern, especially American context. You know, Ezekiel, for sure, he was speaking for God, so people better listen. If Ezekiel got lazy, then the people wouldn't get forewarned, and yeah, it would be his fault. But it, you know, that's a little bit different than a Christian today, though we all ought to speak for God. We all ought to, you know, play that role. But at the end of the day, we can't assume like we can for Ezekiel because we have Ezekiel 1 and 2 leading up to chapter 3. We can't assume that we're the only means by which a lost person will hear what they need to hear. But so what? We should still tell them anyway. I mean, it's our job to do evangelism. It's our job to do discipleship. It's our job to warn people when they're doing something self-destructive, you know, the, this is how you treat people well. But at the end of the day, to me, the real problem here is not applying this to evangelism. Okay, I, I'm fine with that if, if we tell our congregation what the passage actually meant in context and make it clear that this is an application. Fine. The real problem to me is, is how this trajectory ties God's hands as though if you know, like, like God's depending on you so much that if you fail, then that person's eternal destiny is sealed and, and, and God's just had enough. God, God just, you know, stamp that guy's ticket to hell. That's just, that's absurd. That's absurd. You know, God is going to be interested in the lost because that's his nature. And he's going to, if you disobey, he's going to bring somebody else along. You know, he, he's, he's going to still be trying to do what he you know, wants to do, trying to get done what he wants to get done. And that is, you know, to, to save people from, from this destiny. I think it says far too much, uh, to, to sort of tie God's hands. William was wondering if Mike would go over Psalm 139, highlighting verse 16, looking at a parallel Bible online at about all possible verses, some add yet imperfect in the verse with this phrase yet imperfect, make it more about David himself. And also, can you touch on the word Gollum? Okay, yeah. Yeah, the, I'll read Psalm 139, 16. Your, this is ESV. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So if you compare translations here, they are going to differ. Some will say, something like ESV has, my unformed substance. Others will use this, this imperfection language. And, and the, the alternatives really derive from the same place, the same Hebrew word, which the, the, the question included, this word golem. So if, we, if you actually look that up you know, in a lexicon, the, the fundamental you know, meaning to this is something like unformed or um, you know, not having shape. 
you know, shapelessness or something like that. So when, it, when a translator is looking at this, they could choose imperfect. In other words, it, it's imperfect. It's not what it's supposed to be because it's unformed. So they, they could choose between a word like imperfect or unformed, or they could, in the, in the case of the question, they could actually loop them both into the, into the translation to try to communicate the idea that what is being talked about here is not fully formed. It's not what it's, what it is destined to be. It's not what it's supposed to be or what it will be. So this idea is, is about the contents of the womb. Okay. It has nothing to do with, you know, David's father or mother, or even David himself in a moral sense. It has to do with, Hey, when I was conceived, I wasn't like fully conceived. And we know this. And an ancient person would know this because, you know, they, they did have, you know, stillborn children, or they did have, you know, miscarriages. Or again, a woman, you know, could be, you know, killed in battle or something like that. And then the, the contents of her womb exposed or something like that. Or again, uh, you know, this, you know, a miscarriage situation. They, they know what, what the inside of a woman's womb looks like at, you know, basically all stages or various stages, anything you can see with the naked eye anyway. And so they, they know that when a child is conceived in the womb, it's not like it's going to look when it's birthed. <laughs> okay. And that's what the verse is talking about. And, and, and Golem actually uh, reflects that. So the net Bible, again, which I want to recommend, I, I, you know, it has a nice succinct note here. Net Bible is a free resource. I, I highly recommend it because it'll get into stuff like this. Uh, it says here, uh, Hebrew behind, you know, your eyes saw my shapeless form. The Hebrew noun Golem occurs only here in the Old Testament. In later Hebrew, the word refers to, quote, a lump, a shapeless or lifeless substance, unquote, or to, quote, unfinished matter, such as in a vessel wanting finishing or that needs to be completed or finished, unquote. And they, they cite here Jastro, and this is Jastro's, um, uh, he has a lexicon. And I think this actually you could get for free online because it's an older resource. I think you can get this in PDF. I actually have it in, in Logos, which I of course recommend because of the searchability. But, um, again, Jastro and, but here's the entry for Golem. Um, I'm looking at it right now. And like the net Bible note says, you know, shapeless mass, you know, lump or shapeless or lifeless substance, that sort of thing. Uh, it is interesting that, that the word will be used for anything that's sort of unfinished or that needs to be completed, you know, more broadly than, than the contents of a woman's womb. So Net Bible brings up the example of a vessel. You have here one of, one of his, he, he quotes, you know, something rabbinic about the word being used for an unmarried woman being a, a quote unquote unfinished vessel. Well, you know, obviously a, a an unmarried woman who's long out of the womb, you know, is physically complete, but, but in, again, in the culture, she's not complete because she doesn't have a husband yet, doesn't have her own family and so on and so forth. So that there, there's a little bit of a use of the term there for something more abstract. Um, so something that isn't completed yet is really the, the, the fundamental meaning here. Again, this has nothing to do with, you know, moral character or sinfulness or, or anything like that. It re just refers to the fact that it's not what it's intended to be yet. It's not what's there. And so how translators communicate that idea is going to be, you know, it's, it's going to vary. They could, you know, opt for something a little more succinct, like shapeless, or they could add imperfect to that, combining words. You know, this is what translations do. They just try to communicate what, what's actually there. Um, the translation, I think here, let me, let me just take a one look back at ESV just to see how they did this. You saw my unformed substance. Um, a more dynamic rendering would be something like um, adding when I was in the womb. I'm just, this is just for sake of illustration. I, I'm not thinking of any particular translation, but even though the words when I was in the womb aren't in the verse, a translator could add that just to clarify what, what's going on. But again, translations differ. This is why because the effort is to try to communicate something specific, or at least as specific as can be communicated, it's going to come down to translation philosophy. If your translation thinks that, that their job, that the translator thinks their job is word for word correspondence and no more, well, then you're going to get something like unformed with no elaboration. 
if they're looking at something that, that's more uh, the translation philosophy is dynamic equivalent, where we can use however many words we need to in English to communicate the idea, well, you know, then you're going to have some elaboration. Patrick wants to know, does the biblical numerology and name codes indicate that the writers made events up to fit theology? Or did these people in numbers actually reflect, reflect reality? Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm not going to do it, but I, I would personally reword this question because I'm not sure what Patrick is specifically thinking of. Um, when he talks about name codes, I have to, I have to guess that he's thinking of gematria. Uh, we just had this with 666, of course, in the Revelation series. Uh, biblical numerology, you know, okay, gematria is a form of that, but there are other things going on with numbers. So I'm not I'm not specifically sure what what he's angling for, but let, let's just let's just go with gematria here. Uh, I would say that when gematria is actually used, which is rare in the Bible, the circumstances and people are real or intended as real. Um, and when I say intended as real, I'm talking about like with eschatology or some conditional statement. In other words, there there's like in the in the six 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 thing. The number's given, it's the number of a name, it's, it's a mark, so on and so forth. Well, it, it's describing a person yet to come. So the description is intended to convey a thought about a real person, but he's not real yet because he's not here yet because we're talking about eschatology. That's all I'm saying about intended as real. So when, when the Bible does use gematria, it is, it is trying to communicate something specific either in, in some episode or about some real person or, again, projecting out in the future some, some cir- circumstance that will come about, come to pass. So there's no necessary contrivance or irreality that is necessarily tied to the use of gematria. Now, let's pick a, another example. Maybe it'll illustrate it a little bit better. Uh, and again, gematria is rare, but there are these that I think are, are, are pretty reasonable. In the case of the Gospels, the 153 fish, you know, after this post-resurrection appearance, uh, when the, the, the disciples, you know, encounter Jesus again, and this is the, the very famous episode, but, but John actually gives us the number of the fish they caught, 153. Like, what, what, did you just get out and count them? Or how do we know this is real time? Well, in, in that case, he could just be using gematria to communicate a specific idea, but the people about, you know, about whom he is relating the idea are real people. I, I, my view is that the 153 fish, and I don't know if I've, if I've actually written about this or not. I, I use this in my, my second novel, uh, but the 153 fish by Gematria can be spelled out as sons of God. And so, you know, when, when Jesus repeats, you know, he reiterates that I'm, you know, making you fishers of men, you know, and, and we have this account where the disciples now, the, the relationships restored with Peter and you know, all this sort of stuff going on, this post-resurrection appearance, you would use this to communicate the idea that, that you are my children, we st- we're still in relationship, and now you're tasked with going out and finding other children of God. Basically, it's the Great Commission. Well, that, it's, a, it's a cryptic gematria way of referring to these ideas, but they're spoken in a real circumstance to real people, the disciples. We know P- Peter and Jesus were real, okay? So, that for that reason, the, the the question, I think, kind of connects two things: irreality and gematria unnecessarily. Another episode. Uh, I I personally think that at the the baptism of Jesus, the reference to the dove is probably gematria. Um, the 153 fish you'll find in commentaries. The, the the thing with the with the reference to the dove that's a little more obscure. Uh, you're not really going to pick that up in too many commentaries, or I don't know any, I, I just came across that idea from a different source. And the, the issue is that the gospel writers use a particular word for dove, peristeron, when they could have used other words for, you know, another word for a dove or, a, you know, some neutral word that could be any bird or whatever. But, but peristeron is the one used. And it, by gematria, the letters in peristeron add up to the same total as the first two letters of the Greek alphabet, Alpha, Omega. So here you have at Jesus' baptism a sign from the Holy Spirit that the one being baptized is the Alpha and the Omega. Again, I just don't think that's a coincidence. 
uh, it, it really suggests to me that, that there is some, some of this kind of communication going on. But again, it's Jesus. He's real. He was really baptized. So it, the connection with irreality is, is not a, a necessary one, or, or in these cases, even a coherent one. Mark in Irvine, California, has our next question, and it is, if the fallen angels that fell before the flood are in prison under the earth, then where is Satan and the fallen angels now? Were there two separate falls? Also, was Satan the leader of the fallen angel rebellion before the flood? Why are some in prison now, and how does that explain fallen angels and Satan on the earth now? Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to answer this question with the answer that's probably creeping into the minds of thousands of people listening to this, and that is read the demons book. <laughs> you know? I mean, all of this is is dealt with there in, in detail. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat all that information here, but the, the short form is Satan is the Lord of the dead, the underworld. So that's his, if we can use this phrase, that's his living space. Now, as it were, that's where he was, you know, banished. Uh, at, at his own uh, rebellion, you know, back in the garden. He can come and go as he wants. Uh, yes, there were separate falls. Okay, there, there are really three, uh, three falls, three, three rebellion events is a better way to put it. Um, in Genesis 1 through 11, that explains evil in the world, in, in the biblical worldview, so on and so forth. So, yep, there are separate falls. There's no indication in the Bible that Satan had anything to do with the Watcher Rebellion or the, or the Rebellion of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. There, there's no verse that ever says that. Now, there are, there are reasons to conclude that Satan would be perceived hierarchically as the, the rebel par excellence or the, the, the uh, sort of the archetype or the... Uh, the rebel that gets the most street cred among all other rebels, you know, that this, there, there's a reason why he's, he's sort of talked about or, or cast in certain passages as having preeminence over the other ones. And, and again, read the demons book for all that. Now I will say first Enoch flirts with the idea of, of Satan having some role in the watcher Genesis six rebellion, because the leader of that group in First Enoch is referred to, well, by several names, but two of them are Asael and Azazel. They're used interchangeably for, for the lead watcher. Now, those two terms become terms that are applied to Satan and, and the domain of Satan being the wilderness, you know, the, the, the place that's un-Eden, the place that's anti-Eden, the place that is antithetical to what Eden was in biblical thought. But again, all the details for this are in the, the demon's book as to why these thoughts would be sort of chained together in Second Temple Judaism um, and, and how they, they sort of seep into the New Testament in, in certain places, at least a few of the ideas later on. All right. Becky has a question about 1 Samuel 27, 8 through 10. When David was killed in Philistines and telling Achish otherwise, was he possibly working under a harem idea of continuing to wipe out those directed by God to exterminate? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, it's an interesting question. You know, certainly Israelite readers of, you know, first Samuel 27, in this case, this is the Akish, you know, situation. Uh, certainly Israelite readers would have connected those dots because of Joshua 11. If you recall Joshua 11, around verse 22, says that there's Joshua proclaims victory by saying there's no, no more Anakim in the land. Well, except for the ones that got away and went to the Philistine cities, you know, and he lists a few Philistine cities. Of course, one of them is Gath, and that's where we find Goliath later, Goliath the Gittite. He's, he's one from Gath, of course, his brothers. And so, you know, anyone who's aware of that story or if, if in, in, in scripturated form, in written form, if they had read the story, they're, they're going to be thinking along these lines because some of the Anakim wind up in Philistine territory and lo and behold, Goliath and his brothers are giants. Okay. Now the text never actually explicitly makes that connection though, even though it's, it's sort of understandable how someone's mind would go there. So I think at least with respect to Goliath and his brothers, again, because they're giants, the idea is probably legit. 
you know, that, that this is, is part of the picture of, you know, David's conflicts with the Philistines. Uh, it, it's, it, it's a reasonable supposition, even though, again, the text doesn't spell it out specifically. But First Samuel nowhere uses the kerem uh, vocabulary generally of conflicts with the Philistines. So you, you can't just say that they were thinking this with respect to all of the Philistines, but certainly if you have a few giants kind of stumble onto the battlefield, and okay, you know, it, it's the Anakim again, here we go. You know, again, it's a reasonable supposition. Now, First Samuel does use harem vocabulary for the Amalekites. And this is First Samuel, uh, let's see, I think it's chapter 9. Let me, just, let me just take a quick look here. So in, in 1 Samuel, like 14, 48, you've, you got the Amalekites mentioned, but it, in chapter 15 is when you have a kind of an important passage with respect to this question. So you have here um, 1 Samuel 15. I'll just read a couple of verses here. Uh, Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts. I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction. There's the kerem vocabulary, all that they have. Okay, so you, you have this, this language used specifically of the Amalekites. And if you remember in, in our, our series on Exodus, this is episode 283, the Amalekites more broadly than just the Philistines, okay? Because, again, this language isn't used broadly of the Philistines, but it is used of the Amalekites. The Amalekites descended from a giant clan, okay? And you can go listen to Naked Bible Podcast, episode 283, and they were cursed under Moses. So they, as a clan, you know, as, as a people group, they have roots uh, in, in terms of where they come from to again, one of, one of the, the people groups back in, uh, that are associated with the conquest that are specifically associated with giantism. Okay. The, the, the connections there in the case of the Amalekites, but it's, it's not specifically there in the case of the Philistines, except for, again, the vestiges of the Anakim that fled there. So I think that's why there's a difference in the vocabulary here between these two people groups. But you know, even having said that, like I said, I think for Goliath and his brothers, yeah, you know, that this is probably, a uh, a legitimate trajectory of thought uh, with respect to the um, the whole enterprise of Kerem because it was about eliminating the giant clans in the first place. Here you have some vestiges among the Philistines. And so, you know, it, 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 it kind of fits. It kind of makes sense there. Well, let's see if we can't get some good answers here from you today. Yeah. Our first question's from Curtis, uh, and it's about 1 John 5, verse 16 through 17. What is John talking about with a sin that leads to death and sin that doesn't lead to death? Well, believe it or not, this question is one that I actually addressed in something I've written, my little book, I Dare You Not to Bore Me with the Bible. So I, th I thought, you know, when I saw this question, I thought, well, I'm just going to read a little portion of, of what I wrote in that book. And I guess this is a good opportunity for me to remind readers that, you know, I, I have some smaller books from Lexham Press that, you know, I've tackled a lot of these things. You know, there's I Dare You Not to Bore Me with the Bible, and then there's one called The Bible Unfiltered. And they are collections of articles I wrote for Bible Study Magazine. And a lot of this kind of stuff is in here. And I, I think if memory serves me correctly, uh, I noticed a few questions in this Q&A, or, or maybe maybe it's down the road that are addressed in, in either or both of those little books. So that's how I'm going to approach this one here. So the, the sin unto death is a common question. And I wrote a little piece called Tough Love uh, in I Dare You Not to Bore Me with the Bible. So I'm just going to read a little bit from that. I wrote, it's a common myth that God will always bring us back to repentance. This myth is debunked in the first letter of John. While John writes that, quote, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 9. He also tells us that sometimes God never gives us another chance to confess our sins and be forgiven. In 1 John 5, 16 through 17, the apostle gives us the other side of the sin, confession, forgiveness coin. So here's where we get the verse, the, the, the passage that Curtis is wondering about. 
which reads in, I think this is L-E-B, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. So there's sin that leads to death and then other sins that don't lead to death, according to these verses. So back to my my little entry here, I wrote, put simply, there are sins that Christians commit that don't lead to death, but there are some that do. Is John talking about a divine law of cause and effect where a specific sin irrevocably results in death? Well, not exactly. We can be certain that John has no specific sin in mind because he never names a sin in this passage. John is saying that there may come a time when God has had enough of our sin and then our time on earth is up. We cannot know when such a time might occur, so we shouldn't be in the habit of sinning with impunity. John had actually seen this happen. In Acts 5, 1 through 11, Luke relates the incident of Ananias and Sapphira, who led or who lied to Peter and to God about the proceeds from a piece of property they had sold. They were under no obligation to give any of it to the church, but they pretended that they had given all the money to the Lord's work. When confronted by Peter, both of them collapsed and died on the spot. Luke writes that, quote, great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things, Acts 5.11. No doubt this incident left an imprint on John's mind, but John would also have known that there was Old Testament precedent for sin unto death as well. In Numbers 11, in response to the latest wave of complaining about their circumstances, the Lord sent the people of Israel meat to eat in the form of quails. While the meat, this is Numbers 11.33, quote, while the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague, unquote. John's message to believers was not, God doesn't judge like that today. Rather, it was stop sinning because there is a sin that leads to death. Lest we think God is horrible and negative, we would do well to remember that it was John who penned God as love. In the same letter, 1 John 4, 8, as with Ananias and Sapphira, removing a sinning believer from the church was very tough love, but the fledgling church was all the stronger and more committed for it. So that, that is how I approach the sin that leads unto death. That, you know, sometimes God is, just determines that we're done. We're done. And so whatever that sin was, uh, and God you know, decides that that's the end of the person's life, that their time is up, then those two things go hand in hand to form this idea of a sin unto death. Our next question is from Jessica. How does Sarah fit into the covenant of Abraham? Yeah, this is a logical question because of the fact that Sarah is a woman. Obviously, she's not going to be circumcised. Um, there is, I, I would say, there's something to be said here because of Isaac. You know, the, that when, when Sarah bears Isaac, he is the sign of the covenant. Uh, so because he is, he is her son and she is unable to, to conceive and have children. So his miraculous birth, you know, followed by his own circumcision, again, that would have continued the covenantal line. So there's something in, in regard to that that's going on here. But I'm going to quote again from another one of these little books that I wrote, uh, The Bible Unfiltered, this time. And just to talk a little bit about circumcision, because th- there is something else going on here with respect to women and not just Sarah. Several aspects are clear in regard to circumcision in Old Testament theology and in the historical context of biblical Israel. The Old Testament story indicates that circumcision neither provided nor ensured salvation, nor did it lessen anyone's sim- sinful impulse. In the Old Testament, most circumcised Israelites still turned away from God, practicing idolatry. Their actions eventually prompted Yahweh to punish them with exile. The fact that Israelite men were circumcised meant nothing with respect to their spiritual inclination or destiny. Furthermore, the Old Testament texts are clear that circumcision was not practiced on women. While some cultures and regions around the world have practiced female circumcision, Israel only circumcised males. This indicates that the cutting rite itself did nothing with respect to an individual's ultimate spiritual destiny. If it did, women would not have been, you know, would not have been included in in the covenant, which was obviously wrong. 
Additionally, historical sources indicate that cultures other than Israel, such as Egypt, also practice circumcision for men. This shows that the rite itself had no efficacy in regard to salvation. In other words, it wasn't something mystical or spooky. Rather, its importance was in what the rite signified in conjunction with the promises God gave to Abraham and his descendants. The actual ritual of circumcision, therefore, had nothing to do with salvation or expressing faith in the God of Israel. As far as the meaning, I wrote this. For all Israelites, circumcision was a physical, visible reminder of their identity as Yahweh's covenant people, according to Genesis 17, 1 through 14. They owed their existence both individually and corporately to a supernatural act of God on behalf of Abraham and Sarah in fulfillment of his covenant promise, also Genesis 17, 15 through 21. Circumcision was a constant reminder of the supernatural grace of God. For males, circumcision granted the recipient admission into the community of Israel, the community that had the exclusive truth of the true God. This truth included Yahweh's covenant relationship with Israel and their need to have circumcised hearts, in other words, to believe in Yahweh's promises and worship him alone, according to Deuteronomy 10, 16, and 30, verse 6. In ancient patriarchal Israel, women were members of the community through marriage to a circumcised man or by being born to Israelite parents. Intermarriage with foreign men, in other words, uncircumcised men who were not part of Yahweh's covenant, was forbidden, a prohibition that maintained the purity of the membership, according to Deuteronomy 7, 3 through 5. And this purity was directly related to the spiritual significance of circumcision. Membership in the community was important for a specific reason. Only this community had the truth, the oracles of God, as Paul called God's revelation to Israel in Romans 3, 2. Only Israel had the truth in regard to the nature of the true God among all gods and how people could be rightly related to him, in other words, the way of salvation. Yahweh had created his human community with the goal of giving the way of salvation. And this exclusively is what is meant in Old Testament theology to be elect or chosen, Deuteronomy 7, 7. Election was not equated with salvation since vast multitudes of elect Israelites were not saved due to their unfaithfulness. Every Israelite member of the exclusive community had to believe in the covenant promises and worship Yahweh. Circumcision, therefore, meant access to this truth by virtue of being a member of the covenant community. So for women, when they were married and they had sexual relations with their husband, they would know that their husbands were circumcised, and they would know that's a sign of the covenant. And when they had male children, they would have their children circumcised. So circumcision was still a sign to women, even though they didn't, they didn't uh, take the mark, as it were, on their own bodies. So in, in, in the bigger picture of things, circumcision did have meaning for everyone in Israel. Adam from Baltimore, Maryland, was wondering what Dr. Heiser thinks about David playing an instrument to help Saul with the evil spirit of the Lord in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14 through 23. Would this be considered an Old Testament exorcism? Is the evil spirit Shaddaim? How does this, if at all, correlate to Psalm 91 worldview about demon protection? Yeah, well, I would say... Initially, there, the text does not call the, the quote-unquote evil spirit that troubled Saul Shaddaim. It doesn't, doesn't name this spirit at all. So we can't fill in that gap, um, whether we want to or not. It, you know, we can't add to the scripture there. And as far as Psalm 91 about demon protection, it really doesn't pertain to that, because that psalm is about protection from evil spirits and other calamities. Just, you know, sort of general assaults, whereas 1 Samuel 16 is specifically about judgment. You know, we know who's being judged here, and we know why. Um, It has a different context. Now, as far as the meaning, I'm going to go to my demons book here. So this is another question that, again, the information is found in something that I've written. And in the demons book, I I have uh, in one part of it this. Divine throne room scene in 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23 is useful for considering other instances where Ruach, spirit, may point to an unembodied entity where ambiguity exists, you know, kind of like 1 Samuel 16. In this regard, the following passages are relevant. 
Judges 9, 22 to 23 says, Abimelech ruled over Israel three years and God sent an evil spirit, you know, the, the Ra Ruach between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. So there's this evil spirit between Abimelech and these other, other men. And the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. Again, we, we don't know enough to know whether that's an, an entity or something else. And we'll get to the something else in a moment. In 1 Samuel 16, again, the, the passage that the question actually refers to, we read this. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit, Ruach, from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servants said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our God now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. That's L-Y-R-E. And when the harmful spirit, the harmful ruach from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. That's 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 16. So the next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall, but David evaded him twice. So there you actually have, that's from 1 Samuel 18, 10 through 11, an instance where playing on the lyre doesn't do anything. Saul is still agitated and tries to kill David. In Isaiah 19, 13 to 14, here's another example. The princes of Zoan have become fools, and the princes of Memphis are deluded. Those who are the cornerstones of her tribes have made Egypt stagger. The Lord has mingled within her a spirit, ruach, of confusion, and they will make Egypt stagger in all its deeds as a drunken man staggers in his vomit. Another one in Isaiah 37. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words you have heard, with which the young men of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. It's Isaiah 37, 5 through 7. Now, in each of these passages, a spirit, Ruach, is sent from God, and that spirit affects an individual or group. Remember, an individual or a group in an adverse way. Are these descriptions best understood as God in some way affecting the internal state of mind of the individuals in view, or are they best understood as dispatching a disembodied entity to affect behavior? One could easily conclude based on the usage of Ruach to describe a person's thoughts, feelings, and decisions, which happens all over the place in the Old Testament, that the latter perspective makes sense. However, in light of 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23, which uses quite similar language to that found in these passages, it is at least possible that unembodied divine spirits in the service of Yahweh are in view. So that's a long way of saying it, it could be either. It, it could be either a spirit sent by God, much in the, in the fashion of 1 Kings 22. But since spirit is used so frequently, the same word in the Old Testament for, for our internal life, in our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, just what goes on inside our heads. It could also be that, that God sends, you know, some sort of, uh, he, does, he does something that, that causes psychological troubling with Saul or any, any of these other groups of people, these individuals in these passages. And so it, the, the passage itself is actually ambiguous. It could be either. Now, when you get to New Testament demons, Okay, evil spirits, the same kind of language, but now we're in Greek. We're not, you know, we're not talking Hebrew here. There are instances where someone is troubled by an evil spirit, and it is associated with a physical or psychological malady, something like epilepsy or paranoia or some other neurotic, you know, kind of thing. And in those instances, it's it's probably better to say that we're not dealing with a, a disembodied spiritual entity, but Again, God casting some judgment on a person that renders them this way, um, you know, for, for whatever judgment purpose God has in mind. But there are other passages where evil spirits are not accompanied by sort of this physical or mental emotional language, and where the evil spirit that, that is troubling someone speaks, like speaks to Jesus or protests or uh, you know, ask not to be judged, and they have a conversation. So in that case, it's very clear that we do have a disembodied entity. So it could be one or the other. 
and the Old Testament passages just are not clear on this. But what what is clear is that we don't have, you know, if, if we have an exorcism here of Saul, it didn't work because when David plays the lyre in, the, in 1 Samuel 18, that actually provokes Saul into trying to kill him. So I, I personally think, I, I lean toward, toward Saul being judged by some physical or psychological judgment sent from God, not a, not a, a specific entity. Again, there, there's, no, there's no entity named. There's no specific exorcistic language you know, about casting them out. And in fact, you know, playing the lyre doesn't work you know, in, in the one situation. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And that suggests to me that, that what's going on with Saul is something, again, inside of him that God has sent uh, his way to judge him and, and not specifically an evil spirit. But it very well could be. That is a possibility. Our next question is from Chris. I listened to the Naked Bible podcast about the head cover head covering in 1 Corinthians 11, and I want to know if it has to do with the physiological understanding of that time. Why does Paul call it a sign of authority in 1 Corinthians 11.10? I know you said Genesis 6 and the sin of the watchers is in view, but while I can see how it would prevent lewdness at the time, I couldn't make the connection as to how it shows being under authority. Yeah, well, we'll uh, this will be a short answer because I'll narrow it to the authority part. I, I do think Paul, in this passage, doesn't want a repeat of Genesis 6, and, and that is his concern. That's why he says, because of the angels. And, you know, and, and the head covering language for in the Greco-Roman world, not the Jewish world, but he's writing to the Corinthians. So in, in Greco-Roman medical texts, as the episode on the head covering, you know, shows, you know, with, with, you know, ample documentation, uh, the head covering idea had, had something to do with becoming pregnant and sexual activity. As strange as that sounds to us, you'll find it in the writings of people like Hippocrates, you know, the Hippocratic oath that doctors take today. This is Greco-Roman medical thinking at the, at the time. And it has some connection to Again, pregnancy, ability to conceive, fecundity, all that stuff. But as far as the authority, the authority here references the woman's husband. She is to be modest so as not to tempt other men as well, or in Paul's mind, God forbid, the angels. So by, by, by virtue of what she does in, in covering you know, her, herself, that is a sign that she is essentially, she belongs to someone already. Um, and so that... In, in that respect, it's a sign of, of authority that in the culture of the day that the husband would have authority over his wife uh, in, in all matters sexual and, of course, lots of other things, too. But that's why Paul loops that in, too. This, this, it's, another, it's, a, it's just another aspect of what the sign would mean to the people who are seeing it. George has a question about Moses and Zipporah. According to Numbers 12, 1, it says that Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. Wondering if the Cushite woman is Zipporah, and why is she a Cushite, when she is supposed to be from Midian? Perhaps I missed out something when Dr. Heiser was explaining about locating Midian. Or did Moses remarry? Well, there... <laughs> There are two views of this. One says that the woman is Zipporah because the theory is that someone named Cush is Cush or Kish is in her line. Okay, that's probably not the case. Now, I'm going to I'm going to read something from Baruch Levine in his Numbers commentary because this concerns Numbers 12:1. Cush designates the Sudan, Nubia. Again, if this is a geographical reference rather than a personal reference, a personal name. So it designates the Sudan, Nubia, the land south of Egypt, though Cush is sometimes identified as Ethiopia. The woman in question was most certainly not Zipporah, according to Levine, who is identified specifically as a Midianite woman, Exodus 2, 16 through 22. According to Exodus 18, 23, Zipporah had been sent home earlier, but was later brought back to join Moses by Jethro, her father. Most likely, Moses had married the Cushite woman during Zipporah's absence. Again, that's speculative, but it, 
it, it is a way that you could be reading Exodus 18, 2 through 5. The basis of the criticism by Miriam and, and Aaron is not explained, and there has been, you know, understandably a lot of speculation on this subject. The inhabitants of Cush are black, according to Jeremiah 13, 23, but race could not have been the point at this issue. Perhaps there was an objection to the taking of a second wife, which might have been regarded as an affront to Zipporah. Genesis 31.50 gives evidence of such objection because Laban insisted in his treaty with Jacob that the latter not take additional wives beyond Rachel and Leah, his daughters. Ancient Near Eastern marriage contracts often contain provisions that a first wife's children would be protected as heirs in the event of the husband in question taking a second wife during the mother's lifetime. So that, that's the end of what Levine says. So I, I, that's probably a more, a more reasonable perspective here that we have Moses ma- taking a second wife, and that causes the objection because of the connection to Midian, which is, of course is connected in some way uh, you know, to Sinai, and, you know, without getting all, into all that mess, which we spent probably five weeks talking about in the Exodus series. Um, so there, there, there could have been something maybe that smacked of a, they were wondering if this was a, a covenantal violation or, you know, violation of Jethro's trust or, or something like that, or maybe Midianite marriage. We, we just don't know for sure. But of the two options, it seems more reasonable because she is specifically, Zipporah is identified as a Midianite and not a Cushite. And it's probably the case that Moses married a second time. And that was considered an affront for whatever reason by, um, you know, by Miriam and Aaron. So, again, it's there's a little ambiguity there, but I think the the evidence leans in that direction. All right, Mike. Well, we've got some great questions from s- some great people. So, why don't we just get into it here with Seth, who has our first question about Numbers thirty two. He asks, Numbers thirty two has Reuben and Gad bargaining with Moses over if they can live outside of the promised land. Is there any significance to this? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to defer to uh, Jacob Milgram's massive numbers commentary here for this. Uh, There is significance. Milgram spends 30 pages, believe it or not, on this issue. So is there significance? Yeah. Is it, is it far too detailed and dense for a podcast? Yep. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm going to read a, a little bit of an excerpt from from uh, what Milgram says here that, that might help a little bit as far as this Q&A. So beginning in Numbers 21, he writes, we find a series of relatively early texts dealing with the Transjordanian experience. The historiographic accounts and poetic excerpts preserved in Numbers 21 and 22 record that the Israelites, after conquering the Transjordan territories north of the Arnon, in the Moabite, Mishor, and the Bashan region, arrived at the plains of Moab. They settled in the Amorite towns. Now, keep that in mind. The, these are Amorites, okay? They settled in the Amorite towns and in Jazer and its dependencies. These reports were followed by the Balaam pericope, that's Numbers 22 through 24, which probably derives from independent sources, poetic and narrative, and that projects hostile relations just short of war with the Moabites. Then comes the brief account of a serious religious lapse at Baal Peor, Numbers 25, 1 through 5, once again indicative of hostile relations with the Moabites, expanded by priestly writers to include the Midianites as well. This is followed in the historiographic chain by the present chapter, Numbers 32, which is where he's going to be discussing Reuben and Gad, like Seth asked in his question. So there's a this chapter is historiographic in nature, and that, that chapter, back to Milgram, he writes, there's an agenda that progresses to questions about the legitimacy of the Transjordanian Israelite communities. Numbers 32 performs a pivotal literary function. It carries forward the historiographic chain that began in Numbers 21 by focusing on an issue prominent in the writings of Deuteronomy 3 namely the legitimacy of the Transjordanian tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So our, what, what Milgram is suggesting here is that this chapter is here specifically because people wondered, were Reuben and Gad legit? You know, were they legit as tribes because they're settling outside the original promised land? And 
by virtue of the inclusion of this chapter, the answer is yes, they're still legit. So Milgram continues, he says, what must concern us in commenting on Numbers 32 is the way that the territorial legitimacy of the two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh, is treated. It is conceived as a special dispensation to the tribes involved who were really supposed to cross the Jordan and settle in Canaan proper, but were excused from doing so by Moses under the terms of a negotiation, granting them territories in Transjordan. This dispensation remains a matter of ongoing concern to other biblical writers. Historically, the Transjordanian Israelite communities flourished from early times until the Assyrian deportations, which began in 734 BC and continued until 721 BC. That's the, the capture of the northern tribes. Just when the Israelite communities of Transjordan originated is an open question, but there are indications that their beginnings may go back as early as the Cisjordanian Israelite settlement, which probably occurred between the late 12th and early 10th centuries BC. So what, what Milgram is, Milgram's dipping into critical theory here, basically saying, though, that these tribes are chronologically in concert with the other ones. During the reign of David in the 10th century, there may have been some expansion of Israelite settlement in the Transjordan, and therefore, in the early 9th century BC, Omri and his successors added considerably to the Israelite presence there. We are dealing, therefore, with a network of Transjordanian Israelite communities that were joined to the northern kingdom of Israel for at least 200 years, and with probably earlier history of settlement as well. So basically he's saying, you know, there were people who lived, you know, after, and biblical writers who lived after the Mosaic period that wondered about the tribes because of, of what they were, where they were living. And so Numbers 32 is there to, to reinforce the idea and, and teach people that these are not sub-tribes. They're not second-rate tribes. They're legitimate tribes, and they're, they're living where they're living because Moses allowed it. He, he granted it you know, in this negotiation. And so that's the purpose specifically of Numbers 32, to explain why they're there and that, that it had Mosaic approval, and so that these tribes should be considered legitimate. Now, my take, again, along with, with those thoughts here, is that, I'll just add a few things here. I, I think the Amorite connection is significant. I think this is also why we have Numbers 32. And this, this really gets into the weeds, but this, this goes all the way back to how, who are the people who are in Canaan when the Israelites arrive? And why do they have giant clan traditions in their in their history, in their literature, and in their history. One of these is the Amorites, and the Amorites are, are at, at the core of the whole giant clan question. So if you go to the book of Amos, the 8th century, that's the 700s BC, prophet Amos was undoubtedly referring to the Transjordanian victory over Sion, the Amorite king. Remember, these Transjordanian tribes, they conquered an Amorite king. So it goes back to defeating the vestiges of Genesis 6, the, the, the whole giant clan thing. And, and that, that alone is another way to demonstrate their legitimacy, that God is using them, and he, and he uses Moses here to grant this concession to live over in these other tribes or the, these other lands that are you know, the other side of the Jordan, specifically to make sure that the Amorite problem is cleaned up. And, it, and Amos 2.9 says, after this, I verily, I destroyed the Amorites before their advance, whose height equaled the height of cedars and who was mighty as oaks, after I verily destroyed his fruit from above and his roots down below, Amos 2.9. So in Amos 2.9 and 10, the Amorites are described as exceeding, you know, very unusually tall, just like the giant clans that go by other names in the book of Numbers and the book of Deuteronomy and, and all these other places that we read about them. So their presence in the Transjordan has something to do as well with cleaning up the giant clan problem. And so it, it, they're, they're legitimately there. They're, they're there by permission, and it's not something that makes them, should make them suspect or sub-tribal when it comes to the rest of the nation of Israel. Micah has our next question. Episode 289 spends a brief time talking about the glutton son passage in Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21. Mike uses that 
as a text to show how Israel is a pre-existing theophany that God is working with. He claims the text doesn't endorse the theophany system and their practices. I agree with him, but I find this text hard to make that distinction. That's because of how 21 ends, quote, So you shall remove the evil from your midst, and all Israel will hear of it and fear, end quote. My question then is, how does Deuteronomy 21, 21b not endorse the practice practiced by the theophany? Well, I have to confess here, Trey, that I can't make sense of this question at all. It's because of Micah's use of the term theophany. A theophany is an appearance of God. So there is no, a phrase like pre-existing theophany doesn't make any sense, nor is there a any such thing as a theophany system. And theophanies don't practice things. The the whole question is confusing to me, and I really can't parse the question, because that, you know, theophany is an appearance of God. And none of this would relate to an appearance of God, including the actual scripture verse references in Deuteronomy 21. So I, I just don't know what Micah is asking here. All right. Well, if you don't know, I don't know. So don't ask me because I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, I I, I can't follow the question. All right. Our next one is from Stephen from Bulacan in the Philippines, Mike. Wow. Yeah, there you go. All right. Stephen has a question about judges and noticed something in chapter one that confused him. It begins by saying that Joshua had just died and someone had to go up against the Canaanites. God says, don't worry about that. Send Judah. Judah then goes to Simeon and says, hey, brother, why not give me a hand here? Simeon agrees and comes with. The issue is this. How the heck are Judah and Simeon still alive this far after Genesis 50 when Joseph dies? I know Old Testament chronology is tricky, but the wording here is messing with me, and I cannot find any info for this online. Please help. Well, the answer is is kind of obvious, actually. Judah and Simeon, as far as those two individuals, sons of Jacob, they're not alive. They're dead. They're long dead, just as the, the question presupposes. Speaking to Judah or to Simeon in these passages should not be construed as speaking to those men. Rather, the references is to their tribes. Their, their tribes bear their names. Like, you know, a messianic prophecy you know, where Bethlehem of Judah is is recognized or some other specific place, whether it be Judah or Simeon or Levi. I mean, a lot of these references are corporate. They refer to the entire tribe that bears the name of their forefather, the, the, the one who founded the tribe or the founding member, which was one of the original sons of Jacob. That's what you have going on here. So there's no there's no necessary reason to think that the text is referring to these two individual men, uh, two individual sons of of Jacob, who are long dead. Rather, it refers to their tribes who bear their names. Kimberly has a question about the difference between the Book of the Covenant and the two tables of stone. Why do you suppose God wrote with his finger on the tablets when Moses had already wrote the book? As well as how many times did Moses go up into the mount to meet the Lord? One time he comes down to warn the people to stay back beyond the boundary. Another he comes down when the people are in a heinous apostasy. And another he comes down and builds 12 pillars and an altar. Am I reading this right? Uh, my, the way I'm going to answer is to say go Listen to the episode in the Exodus when we hit this, this section, because we specifically do discuss this. There are several items in the book of Exodus that are not chronological on purpose. Uh, and this section is included in that, that issue, the, or that, that group of texts that are not chronological. And we discuss the role of different sections in the series on Exodus, but their arrangement here is for literary reasons not to present a flow, a continuous flowing chronology. So that's the best answer I can give you. Go back and listen to the, the specific uh, episodes where we get into this, because uh, they're not chronological and they're not chronological by design. They're, they're designed to, to draw attention to some specific things. 
Now, the Book of the Covenant, I suppose, refers to, you know, the the application of the laws of the, of the you know, the Ten Commandments. Um, again, it's it's an assumption as to when that was written in relationship to the two tablets. I would think the two tablets come first chronologically, and then the the rest of the of the the covenant, the application of those laws, extend from the tablets. And Moses would have naturally written have written those afterwards. But but that all gets that all gets jumbled in this section and in other sections of Exodus that are not chronological, just out of the gate. And so that, you know, you're you're reading the text closely, which is good, and you're noticing these chronological points of disconnection. But the material that is is arranged the way it is, specifically to draw attention to a couple of thoughts or a couple of key ideas. And so uh, it's best to go back and, and listen to the episode for that. Jerry has her next question in Isaiah 40, verse 2, where it says, She has received double for all her sins. I heard somewhere years ago that it was in reference to a notice having been put on the city gates for all to see concerning a sin committed, as was custom, now having been doubled over and renailed so the offense can no longer be seen, in effect blotting it out. Do you know if there's any truth to that? Yeah, I, I don't know of any such custom. I mean, that, that doesn't mean there isn't one, but I've, I have never come across anything like that. So that's the best way I can answer. To, to, to my knowledge, this seems to be a, an imported idea. Um, in, in, interestingly, in, in Oswald's commentary, he, he notes that the exact sense of this term, kiplaim, is not clear as far as this, this double, you know, double idea. Some commentators believe it should be taken literally in the sense that she, Israel, has suffered twice as much as she deserves, or that it means two generations have suffered. So some go that direction. Uh, another commentator, uh, Grogan, uh, offers this. He writes, double appears to many commentators to be hyperbole, like a deliberate exaggeration, used to impress on the people that the chastisement of the exile is really over. It's actually over. Although some think that it refers to Jerusalem's widowhood and childlessness. And that's actually where, where Grogan and others uh, tend to, to land, that, that the reason why there's a doubling reference here is that it, it's a way of describing Israel, the one who's being judged here, that she is now, you know, she's in a period of widowhood, and she's she's not only a widow, but she's also childless because of the exile. You know, her her husband, as it were, and her children, as it were, and her people are gone. Everything is gone and wiped away, and so she she sort of bears a double judgment that she's now rendered you know, metaphorically as a widow and has no children left. So a lot of commentators gravitate toward that. It, it makes sense. But, you know, you know, to be honest, we can't be really sure because the, the term is, is not a term that's, that's used very frequently at all. And there isn't much in the context that would eliminate other possibilities. But this is a, this is a good possibility that the Jerusalem's condition of being you know, both a widow and having no children because of the exile is what's in view here. But I've never heard of any custom about nailing anything to a wall or a gate or anything like that. Gates were made of stone, by the way, um, you know, back back here. This isn't like, we, we can't assume what's going on in, in Reformation Germany in the 16th century is the same as people do or people did, you know, back in biblical days. So I've, I have never run into that at all. Martin from the UK has our last question. I'm an Anglican, so I've been brought up with the Holy Trinity central to my creed. The more I think about it, though, the less clear I am on it. I like the way the two powers lens unifies the Old Testament and New Testament in terms of Yahweh and the Messiah. I struggle with the Holy Spirit being a separate person equal to Father and Son. It seems to me the Spirit is just how Yahweh lives within his people once they are born anew. Obviously, it's been a contentious issue over time with various groups taking views of the Trinity and, of course, the Great Schism, also being at least nominally about who the Holy Spirit proceeds from. 
I wonder what first century Christians really believed about the Trinity. Well, my argument is that they they were able to discern the two powers idea. And if you're able to discern the two powers idea, which is, can pardon my optimism here, but I think it's pretty clear that you've got a visible Yahweh and an invisible Yahweh. They're both Yahweh, but yet they're also distinct. They could discern that. And then when they come across passages elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible that reference the those ideas, the the, 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 the the two Yahweh ideas, but loop in the spirit, that that is what would have drawn attention. Okay, they would have noticed that. And I think also if they had understood the, the, just the two, even if they didn't notice the, the Old Testament stuff, if they knew about the two, the two Yahweh idea and see Jesus playing the role of the second Yahweh, well, then when you, in the New Testament, when you get, writers talk about the Lord who is the Spirit, or they call, they, they refer to the Spirit of God as the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of Jesus, that you have to conclude there's a, Trini- there's a Trinitarian reference there. Um, otherwise, you have to deny Jesus' place, you know, in, in the Godhead, or you have to deny the two powers idea. In other words, if you, if you embrace the two powers idea, and you see how Jesus fits into that second slot, as soon as the Spirit gets looped into the picture, either through Jesus in the New Testament or through different, you know, different means in the Old Testament, you come out with three. There's, there's, there's really no other, other conclusion to draw. And this is what they were struggling with. This is what they were trying to articulate you know, way back then. And what I'm referring to in the Old Testament, I think the best example is Isaiah 63. We read, you read through Isaiah 63, you're going to get reference to the Holy Spirit. And, you know, it's during the, during the affliction of the wilderness wanderings and so on and so forth. Uh, this vision, again, of theophany uh, leading the people through, through the wilderness and so on and so forth. And you get to verse 10. It says, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and he himself fought against them. Well, those two terms, rebelled and grieved in Hebrew, show up in Psalm 78. When they're, they're not used of the Holy Spirit, though. So in Psalm 78, in verse 40, they rebel against him, God proper. And way back up in the passage, earlier in the passage, that's Psalm 78, 40. Psalm 78, 17, they, they rebel and sin against the Most High. So right there, that equates the, the Spirit with the Most High. And if you keep reading in Psalm 78, you, you're going to run into the angel as well, because he's there when we were reading in the book of Exodus and these wilderness wanderings. So if you compare, if you can conflate, you know, at least try to try to reconcile the language of, of Isaiah 63 and Psalm 78, you're going to come out with three because you recognize the, the language of two and then the spirit gets looped into this. And it, it, that, that happens in a couple of passages in the Old Testament, but I think the strongest link is how Jesus is used uh, or, or Jesus you know, the, the description of Jesus employs a repurposing of the second Yahweh language from the Old Testament. That happens in the New Testament with, with some frequency. And once that is solidified in your mind, then when, when the New Testament writers talk, start talking about the Spirit as the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, or the Lord, Jesus, who is the Spirit, you know, he is but isn't the Spirit. He's the Son, but he's also the Spirit. You know, when you start getting into that conversation, you have to conclude there's three. But that, you know, this kind of stuff isn't self-evident as the question, you know, know, presupposes. And of course, as Martin knows, it's not self-evident. They have to wrestle with these things. And so I think this is in part uh, the discussion of what they're wrestling with, how how to take all of these references together and and work them out into into a cohesive uh, theological system. And the idea of God being more than one person at one time is not new to the New Testament. It's not new to the Old Testament. This is something you can find in ancient Near Eastern literature. And this is what one of the values of Summer's book called The Bodies of God. He, he gets into this material in the ancient Near East and the Old Testament. And it's why he as a Jew, he's, he's a professor of Jewish studies and biblical studies at Jewish Theological Seminary. So the guy is a Jew, and he writes in his book that, that the concept of Trinitarianism is completely compatible with the Hebrew Bible. So that's not me, that's him. 
And he's a Jew, so he should know. <laughs> okay. So I, I think this is the kind of thing they're struggling with to articulate. And we're, I think we're in a better position because we have access to ancient Near Eastern material, for instance, you know, to, to see how these ideas work out in other cultures, to be able to think about them a, a little bit, a little bit more easily, maybe, maybe that's the wrong word because it's, it's still a, a, a difficult discussion, but we, we have, we have more tools in the toolbox to help us to think about this language than they did. But I think this is what they're, they're struggling with from the scriptures. All right, Mike, another short and sweet one. That's all we got for this week. Any oh, good thing you need to talk about? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure we've got I'm sure we've got a pile of other questions. I mean, can you give us a hint? Like how many questions remain? Because we're creeping up on fifty of these. How many questions we have uh left in the game? Left, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how many? A thousand? <laughs> Eight hundred and seventy five? Oh, I mean let me let me let me re- let me remind myself to to not ever look to you for encouragement. Yeah, we're not even close. I mean, we're not we're not even uh, we're just scratching the surface of this. We're not making a dent in these questions. We've got a, so we, enough what, questions. What you're saying is we could do we could do Q and A for the next year and not get through the list. Oh, easily, easily. That's what you're saying. Easily. Well, that's easily. great. We've got probably three years worth of questions. So, well. Yeah, I feel bad for everybody who we can't get to. Chip but, away. Yeah, we'll, we'll just chip, chip away. away. It's all we can do, Mike. But uh, as we learned from this one and and our previous Q and A, um, some of these are are buried in stuff I've already written or episodes of the podcast we've already done. So maybe it's not quite as bad as that, but probably not. <laughs> I'm looking for the bright side here, Trey. Yeah. Well, no. I, well, but, some uh, of the questions you know we've had for years. So hopefully, we've answered some of those questions as we've gone through, you know, the podcast. So yeah. hopefully, yeah. you know, some people are getting their questions answered one way or well, another, but Hey, that's, that's right. bound to happen. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and again, you can send me your questions at Trey Strickland at gmail.com. We appreciate everybody that has done. So uh, we appreciate these particular questions on this episode and thank Mike for answering them. And with that, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible podcast. God bless you. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.